We got, hey, Sharita. Hey, Kevin. Okay. So this topic today, it was weighing on my spirit just because of things I've seen on social media, interactions that I've had with men. I have all my notes ready for you guys. So we, we get into it today. Okay. But we are going to be discussing unresolved mommy issues or daddy issues specific to men. And we're going to be talking about how those unresolved mommy or daddy issues cause men to have resentment toward women, which manifests itself in multiple different ways. Okay. So we're definitely going there today. Uh, Tynesha talks, what city are you located? I'm in Atlanta. I've been in the A for, for about four years now. So <laughs> that's where we at with it. So just to kind of give you guys a little bit of backstory about why I'm talking about this. I think that it's really important for us to bring awareness to the issues that men face internally when it comes to having unresolved traumas. If you were to do a Google search on daddy issues or mommy issues, you'll notice that the main perspective that comes up, it talks about women, right? So if you look up daddy issues, signs of daddy issues, it'd be like a woman who dates older men or da da da, you know, it's always geared toward women. And so I really want to give men the opportunity just to share how they feel but then we're all about the three A's on my channel, okay? So for y'all who don't know the three A's, awareness, right? Accountability, and then taking action. And so I really want to raise awareness of these issues so that men can take accountability for how they may have caused them to navigate relationships with women and then take action and make changes, right? Healing, working on your spirituality, your religion, Therapy, right? All those things so that you can become a better person. But yeah, Kofi, this topic sounds heavy. I know. I'm sitting here like, there's so much to talk about on this topic that I don't think we can cover it all today. But I really, really want you all to get something good out of this conversation. So that's the goal. But in addition to targeting men with this conversation, women, I think this is very important for you to know about as well, because it's really going to help you with spotting men who might have these issues, right? You're out here getting triggered by men because you're not aware of how to spot the red flags or how to navigate the red flags when you do see them. So this is something that will benefit men and women. Now, as a disclaimer, because I saw some people commenting on just the promo I was doing, I understand that women have daddy issues. I understand that women have mommy issues. We talked about this on my channel before, right? So this is not intended to bash men in any way, but the focus today is on men, right? I want us to adopt a this is not your moment type of approach in this conversation. So yes, we understand that women have issues too, but what we're focusing on today is men. So bringing up, you know, women do this too, da, 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 that is a sign of deflection. And so again, we're here to get a better understanding of the internal battles that men have. Okay. <laughs> so that's my little disclaimer. So without further ado, I do want to bring my guest on today. I'm really, really excited to have him. His name is Mr. Sean Heineman. He is with the It's Scary to Remarry platform. And you know, I love giving people their flowers before I bring them on. But with Sean, I did a previous uh, collaboration with him and the conversation, it just flowed so well. We were talking for so long that it went, it just flowed effortlessly. And I loved his transparency, the vulnerability that he has, pretty much just breaking barriers when we think about men being able to express themselves. He has very, very great perspectives on marriage, relationships, self-development. And so I thought it would be great to have him as a representative for the men. So without further ado, we are going to bring Mr. Sean Heineman into the chat, and then we are going to get to it. Hey, Sean. Hey, Sean. Did I serve you justice? Did I give you your flowers? <laughs> yes, you did. Flowers, flowers. That's what I I appreciate that. Yeah. So, Sean, tell the people a little bit more about you, your brand, where they can find you at, all that good stuff. Yes, you can find me on all social media platforms. And just type in Scary to Remarry. The YouTube channel, Scary to Remarry, everything. So, you can find me on, just type it in, you'll find me. I, I came up with the name Scary to Remarry because I was married for 15 years, went through a divorce. And in that process, I knew I wasn't done with love. So I had to ask myself, am I really ready to do this again? 
do I really want to do this again? And what does the dating scene look like for me at that time, being married for 15 years? And it was a, a personal struggle because I had to realize what do I really want in a woman moving forward? And of course, I married at 40. I mean, I, I married at 24, remarried at 40. So it's just the process of do I have what it takes? Or do I really believe that I have what it takes to do this again? So that's kind of just the gist of it. But you can go to the YouTube channel, find out all about all the stuff that I went through. I'm very transparent about my personal life, uh, about my personal struggles and issues. So thanks again for inviting me on this platform. I appreciate it because this is a, a topic that I'm really passionate about. This is so good. And yes, like Court said, we are all here for the vulnerability because it is so rare. And kind of like uh, a previous comment said, this is a very heavy topic. And I was saying before, I don't know if we can cover every aspect of it, but I'm thinking that we can kind of start with what some of the signs are that a man might have mommy issues or daddy issues, how to navigate those and see how they're impacting your relationships. And then just figuring out what we can do to, of course, improve those things, you know, get better. So I wanted to show a quick clip from one of my previous videos. I'm going to put it in the comments for you guys. But if you did not watch my video that talked about mommy issues, please check it out. That was probably one of my favorite, favorite videos. And it kind of broke down, well, it did break down issues in men and women. So we're going to play a clip that talks about the male aspect. And then we'll go ahead and get started. Clinginess, detachment, low self-esteem, being overly dependent on your partner, and obviously having a poor relationship with your mother. Some of these overlap with daddy issues and they do impact men and women differently. Men who have mommy issues may exhibit frequent contact with their mother, being disrespectful toward women, needing constant validation, being insecure in relationships, a pattern of cheating in relationships, and feeling entitled or better than others. These are not one size fits all situations. You might have mommy issues because you were raised by a single mother. Maybe your mother was abusive. She could have been narcissistic. She might have been absent, had substance abuse issues, overly critical. There's so many different reasons why you might have mommy issues. So we are going to go ahead and get into it. I think I want to kind of focus on just a few of those things from the list. I'm sure, Sean, you could probably come up with a whole bunch of other things that weren't mentioned. Whew. But I think the, the biggest thing, so the, the overarching thing that impacts men is just a, a general sense of resentment or disrespect toward women, right? And I think that a lot of times this can come through as misogyny, having a disdain for women. You see women as the enemy. They are your op, like you can't trust them. And because there is a general sense of distrust, you don't treat them with respect because you feel like you can't trust them. Or I think that sometimes women, men see them as kind of like a, a reflection of their mom, right? So a lot of times men, and you mentioned this in one of your videos, men will date women who have similar qualities as their mother. And if they're mistreating the woman, that's kind of like their subconscious way of getting vengeance on their mom for all those feelings that they have. So what do you think about that? Just when it comes to the general disrespect that men have toward women, how do you think that aligns with possible mommy or daddy issues? Yeah, I think, and, and a lot of it you addressed in that video, which was one of my favorite videos of yours, by the way, because I was like, <laughs> I'm glad you decided to tackle this from a woman's perspective. So I'm glad you brought that up. I, I was doing research and when they talked about overprotective parents, mm -hmm. especially mothers, Men, by nature, and of course, we always talk about being hunters and things of that nature. To be safe all the time as a man, it cripples him. And in, in going, in going into adulthood, even when you think about kids when, especially for boys, cleaning their rooms, like if mom is just doing everything for them, right? they start to look for that kind of woman, you know? So then when, when he's with a woman and she's like, I'm just doing everything for you. Yeah. Because she's parenting you all over again, because that's the kind of woman that you're looking for. Mm. This point got brought up before in something else that I was watching. And it mentioned that the women who aim to 
be a parent to their spouse, you know, whoever you're dating, it actually causes a sense of resentment, whether the man realizes or not, you're not in your head. So do you, do you agree with that sentiment? And if so, why do you think that happened? There are so many places to go with that, right? (laughs) (laughs) There's so many places to go. And let me know if I'm answering this question, but I've seen it time and time again, where moms, it's almost as if they want to raise their son to be the man that they never had. Mm, the son. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Yeah. So ideally in her head, she want her son to be this man that she never had. And in this process, it's like, I want you to be perfect. I want you to be flawless. But we have a tendency to forget to forget that when we're raising kids, especially our boys, they're going to marry someone. We're raising future husbands. So we have to be okay. And, and let me say this real quick, Tanisha. I don't know if, I, I don't think a lot of times we think about that, that we're actually raising future husbands. And I don't ever want to take away from a mother's love, a mother's impact. I don't ever want to discard that. But at the same time, we have to realize, because as fathers, we're tough on our boys because we realize we don't really get that much grace. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're hard because even when I I have three boys, I have a daughter, but I have three boys Mm -hmm. and everything that I teach them, Tanisha, it's all about the end goal. It's all about the future. It's not about today. Right. So a lot of times I'm, I'm raising them, clean up behind yourself, these kind of things. So that way, when you get married, your wife is not going to have to clean up behind you every five minutes. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. you're adequate enough to do that on your own, especially in today's culture where your wife has to work just like you do. So you might have to help fold laundry. You might have to help wash dishes, dishes and, and mop floors and things of that nature. So. Okay. So do you feel like, because a lot of men will feel as if they, they got the short end of the stick with their upbringing in terms of them getting, harder treatment like you said the sisters might have been raised a little bit softer do you feel like that aids to the resentment that men have toward their mothers which translates over into how they view women in general i agree okay. totally agree yeah i think that's important but this is why i think it's important that we have two parent homes and i know this is i hope nobody don't come for me <laughs> but <laughs> Tell them like it is. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's important that we have the two parent home because we can create that balance opposed to feeling like all the pressure is on a young man. Because as a father, even the other day, my eight year old, he, he was not doing everything that he needs to do. And when his mom was gone, she went to get a massage and went to, you know, do some girl stuff. And he couldn't get on his Xbox because the new Fortnite came out. And I talked to him. I said, look, if you do what you need to do, you're going to be good and do it with a with the attitude of gratitude. You, you'll be good. Just do it. Your mom asked you to do something. She wants you to do it because she loves you and she's taking care of you. Sure enough, he followed through today. He was looking like Mr. Clean today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah. I think that's where dads come in and we have those conversations with our boys to let them know that, look, this is your mom, you know, and we kind of. I know hierarchy is almost a scary word by today's standard. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, but I'm just trying to help him to understand, like, you're, this is your mom. Listen to what she has to say to you. And it helps him to become more respectful of women as opposed to thinking that uh, a woman owes him something. Mm, okay. Okay. So I can also see from the male perspective having resentment toward your mom if you feel like that was stripped from you right not having the opportunity to emulate a man in the home or to get that guidance from men it's like you took that from me that would have been beneficial to me being a man so i can definitely see how that that breeds some resentment as well Mm -hmm. yeah And, and then not to mention that especially if you raise in a single parent home and you look like your dad oh lord you look just like him you look just like that. Yeah, that's real. That's real. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the things that we talked about in our previous conversation was 
the climate of things that we're seeing on social media, right? Just how a lot of the dating, the relationship talks, they're very negative, very divisive. They come across as very aggressive. And so my hypothesis, you guys can tell me what y'all think in the comments. I think that a lot of the clips that we're seeing go viral, there are men who have some sort of mommy or daddy issues. And I say that because if you have unresolved traumas with, we're saying mommy and daddy because there is overlapping, but I, I feel like I want the focal point to be mommy issues. Because I think that when you just think about if you're a heterosexual person, the experiences that you have with your dad as a woman, that kind of shapes who you choose to date, vice versa with a man. But what I see is just like these conversations of, I don't need a woman, you know, it's not going to benefit me to be with anybody. Like you're out to get me, you're wrong. I never do any wrong. All of that is tied into these issues that we're talking about with women. So in terms of this climate, how do we, how do we escape that? And how do we make it so that we're not pedestalizing these men who have such negative viewpoints of women? Because these are the people who get the views, right? They're the people who are kind of pulling on people's heartstrings because they know that that is something that's going to invoke an emotional response. And I just want us to get to a point where we're a little bit more aware of that so that we're not supporting that type of content. So how do you feel about that being on the, the flip side of things? Yeah, we talked about this in our previous interview. Mm -hmm. It's it's tough. It really is, especially in this social media age, because of, like you said, the guys that spewing hatred and resentment and things like that, they're the ones that's getting the clicks. They're the ones that's getting ran up on YouTube. I really believe that we have to do life with people offline, right? My mentor, he told me one time, he said, disciples aren't mass produced, they're handcrafted, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you taking one person at a time and you help develop that person, whether if y'all go to a Starbucks. And again, I could be telling my age, but I'm just saying, I think... <laughs> I think one person at a time is how we can create change because with me doing life with you on a regular basis and you seeing me offline, mm -hmm. you never know the person that you can impact. Like think about who impacted Martin Luther King. We don't see that person, but Martin Luther King is grateful for that person. We don't know who mentored Malcolm X. You know what I'm saying? So it just takes the, and I'm just using the mass examples, mm -hmm. but I think it really requires us doing life with someone on a regular basis offline. And social media is a beautiful thing, but people really need to see us move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm 46, representing 40, 40, 40 something year olds out here. <laughs> so if that answers your question, again, it's kind of more of a slow burn. Mm -hmm. but I do think the impact is greater. And I know with this age of social media, it has to be now everything is microwave. Nothing is cooked in a crock pot. Mm, very true. Very true. Yeah. I think that what, what ends up happening is that because we've normalized these conversations, it's like everyone is kind of seeking perfection, right? And this is why we have these disagreements about high value or, you know, who brings what to the table and all those fun things that we love to talk about. Right. But I think that what is happening is it's like, again, because there is a sense of resentment toward women, a lot of men are like, in order for me to even respect you or see you as a fraction of a person, you have to check X, Y, and Z boxes. You have to be this, you have to be traditional. You have to have a low body count. You can't have kids. And they list all these things. Right. And it's become so normal for us to think that way. That my concern is just that we are, we're masking bigger issues because we're normalizing things like this. So that kind of brings me into my next point, because I think one of the issues with men having mommy issues is that a lot of the ways that these issues manifest themselves, they're normalized by society, right? So if we think back to the, the list that I was talking about in the video, emotional unavailability, is a huge one, a huge, huge, huge one. And we're going to go into, you know, what emotional avail unavailability means. But because we live in a society where we say, you know, men don't show emotions, right? You are seen as weak if you do that. 
we put this in the minds of men, but it's a masking underlying issues with emotion, right? And that's directly tied to having issues with your mother. So there was an article about emotional unavailability. And I'll go through this quick. I talked about this in another one of my videos, so I'll link it. But just so that you guys know what it means. If you are emotionally unavailable, it essentially means that you are incapable or unwilling of giving people the, the emotional safety that is kind of justified in a relationship or you struggle with displaying your own emotions or vocalizing them. So you might keep your options open. You feel like relationships are a chore. They drain you. Again, we talked about how a lot of people view marriage. You have anxiety when it comes to relationships. You struggle with trusting people. You worry about losing your independence in a relationship. And so these are things that we're commonly seeing, but again, it's normalized. So how do we how do we push through that? How do we break past these societal norms that are encouraging this type of unhealthy behavior? Since, since we're talking about mommy issues, mm -hmm. and I would just use me as an example real quick, right? My mom was emotionally unavailable. She worked, she took care of us, had a roof over our head. But that played out into my life, into relationships. Mm -hmm. So I became emotionally unavailable to other people because I just didn't know how to process what I felt. And if I did say what I felt, it came out in such a disrespectful way that people weren't able to receive it. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't able to get that at home. Okay. I, I didn't get a lot of hugs and kisses at home. So again, growing up, I was cold. So if I'm with somebody who loves public display of affection, I can't get that to you. you know? Right. So I think a lot of it comes down to, and again, this isn't no shade to, to moms and stuff like that. But I do believe that if, if mom have a healthy relationship with men, that can help sons. And I think that's important because when mom is having issues with men, it's hard for her to not convey that to, to her son. Mm -hmm. You know, so she having, I, I remember as a child, like, and, and no shade to mom, love my mom, just being transparent. I was birthed out of adultery. So every time my dad's, him and his wife anniversary would come around, my mom would come crying to me. Oh no. Yeah. Oh so, no. Yeah. So here I am. I'm Tanisha. I'm like 11 years old. Yes. So that made that that skewed the view of my mom because I'm like, why are you putting up with this? Mm -hmm. So that right there made me because if, if mom not holding it together, how am I expecting to be with a woman that's going to be strong and confident? I'm going to attract those kind of women and sure enough because of my lack of self-confidence those were the kind of women i attracted mm. you know what's interesting so what you just described mm -hmm. is parentification yep. and for those of you who don't know what that is it's literally where as a child your parent is putting you in situations that you shouldn't be experiencing as a child so in sean's example he became the emotional support for his mom because obviously there was disconnect with the dad and so that, again, is something that ties into mommy issues. So there's so many things that kind of go hand in hand. But what's interesting is I think it's kind of like a double edged sword, because like you said, and I've heard so many men say this where they're like, you know, my mom, she didn't really give me hugs. So I struggle with vulnerability. But at the same time, when you ask them about the type of women that they're looking for, they want women who are strong. That's the thing that comes up. I want a strong woman. And when you think about, OK, well, what does a strong woman look like to you? being able to endure whatever hardships without showing any signs of weakness, which is often emotion. So it's like the thing that triggered them as a child is what they're seeking in adulthood. And they don't realize that they're kind of re-traumatizing themselves in that way. And so it becomes a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, and I think you might've addressed this in one of your videos before where we talk, I think where you talked about we attract like mommy or daddy kind of 
people that we are familiar with. And as an adult, we feel like we can solve that problem that we had in childhood. Mm -hmm. So we end up attracting those kind of people. Uh, and, and as I've gotten older and remarried, now that I'm older, I'm like, I need affection. I need those hugs and kisses, you know what I'm saying? But because I was able to identify my childhood trauma with my mom, it's only because I was able to deal with that is that I was able to see my true self. Mm, that's real. That's real. The second thing I want to talk about, again, we're touching on things that are normalized for men based on gender roles that are problematic. I want to talk about sex, sexual habits, because this is something that's so big that I don't think we acknowledge. But just being out in these streets, being a womanizer, being promiscuous, juggling multiple different women, I think that's something that we need to talk about for sure, because we have gotten this idea in our head, right? Based on genetics, you're genetically predisposed to want to spread your seed. So it's normal to want to sleep around with multiple different women. But again, the, the need to have multiple different women to conquer a lot of different women, those things can also be rooted in having issues with your mother, right? So you don't really trust women, you won't commit. Again, you don't have a respect for women. So you just use them. How do we get that out of our head? Like, how do we break? It's something that's been ingrained for so long. The idea that when it comes to respecting yourself, women are only are the only ones who should have sexual standards, right? If a man sleeps around, it's not an indication that there's something wrong with him or something that he needs to heal from. So I, I guess, how do you feel about that? And then how can we convey that messaging to men as well? Yeah, I think as men, we just have to do better. I think it's conversations like this that helps, you know, to have that conversation and to look at men that we respect and admire from a healthy perspective like you know what he's committed to one woman he has one family i can rock with this kind of person i think a lot of times we support unfortunately the guys who have the big platforms who's like hey go do this go do that go sleep around you know and go sow your royal oats and stuff like that so a lot of men are attracted to that now do men like have, being with multiple women and stuff like that, I get it. I'm a man. Uh -huh. I get it. But at the end of the day, is it beneficial? Like, just because you slept around with a lot of women, and at the end of the day, Tanisha, it leaves you empty. Mm -hmm. Like, at the end of the day, you might feel good. You might tell your boys, hey, I was with such and such. But when when the day is over and you're going to, you're going to bed and you have to be with yourself, Mm -hmm. You question yourself. You ask yourself, what am I really doing? And I've talked to numerous guys who were, you know, the high school, you know, quarterback. You know, he had all the women in college and all these different things. I've I've seen them. I've talked to them all. And those guys, they come to a realization that something has to change. Like I'm still empty on the inside. So they still continually chasing, thinking that one woman is going to change them when really the answer is within you not with mm. another woman. So, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. So we have to renew our mind and think different. And again, I think it's about having these conversations and I think we have the wrong people. I won't say wrong, I won't say that. Mm. I think it just depends on who we are, who we can rock with. Are we willing to listen to a different perspective opposed to just the sleeping with multiple women kind of thing? I think we need to have that conversation more often. And I think is I want to kind of address some of these comments because um, a common consensus that I'm seeing is like it's which is true. Right. We tend to inflate the amount of women that men actually have. So in other words, we think men are having more sex than they really are. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is your your sexual habits. So we use the example of using a woman for sex, even if it's just one woman that you're dealing with that is such a norm right so you start to kind of pick women apart and you're like well you're a fun girl you can't be taken seriously but a lot of it just kind of boils back down to your inability to commit to a woman you do these type of casual sexual things and i think that when it comes to a woman right so if i was a woman i just had casual interactions with men every man that i've ever been was just been casual 
you guys will probably be like, oh, she might have some kind of daddy issues, right? She navigates sex in a weird way. But on the flip side, if a man is doing that, again, that is the norm. We don't really bring up the fact that he might have things that he is struggling with as well. But because he's a man, it's normalized. And that's what I want to kind of get at. Because if a man isn't there, so if there's not a father showing him guidance and he's just around his friends, his counterparts who are moving in the same way, who is holding them accountable? Because we talk about holding women accountable quite regularly. And I think that, yes, as a woman, you are responsible to an extent for holding your friends accountable. And if you see something that is a self-destructive behavior, something that they can improve on, I think you should say something. But I just, my concern is that those type of conversations aren't really happening with men because society encourages or enables that type of behavior. Yeah. And, and again, with this social media world that we live in, it doesn't get the clicks. It doesn't get the likes. So you're pushed to the bottom of the totem pole where all the other guys that are saying the more quote unquote popular things, they're getting the attention. So sometimes I think it's hard for guys who it's like speak your truth. If 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 you are if you believe in monogamy with one woman, that's okay. Like be your authentic self. I think sometimes men look to get validated too. Mm-hmm. Instead of just living and where you are. And I always tell people, I'm like, look, I'm happy at home. <laughs> you know, I, I I'm married to one woman. And, and that's okay. And that's my story. And I'm gonna rock with it. But I think too, some men have to go on a journey to where they need to find themselves because they might be lacking that father in the home. So growing up as a kid, they just feel like they should have access to women because mom spoiled them. Mom gave them everything. So they feel like they should have access to women. Agree. Agree. So Hemingway said men should absolutely tell young boys that they should have discipline and focus on more than women. And I agree with that. And that's why it seems like these um, these debates that we have about being submissive and, you know, things like that. They're so counterproductive because we're encouraging women to be more submissive. Right. You should be comfortable with letting a man lead. But we're wanting women to allow a man to lead who doesn't have discipline. And I think sexual discipline is like a huge indicator for me. Like if you can't control yourself sexually, you're all over the place. You're making babies with one person. You're trying to do all these different things because you don't have self-control. To me, that's an indication that you might not be fit to lead a household because you can't you can't control your urges, you know, whatever inner emotions you have. And so I just I wish that more emphasis was placed on that. But I've had so many conversations about sex abstinence, sexual selectivity. And it seems like men, it's like a joke to them. Like if you start having these conversations about, you know, waiting to have sex or, you know, getting to know someone and things like that, it's just something that is so mind boggling for them because it's such a hookup culture right now. So there's not really a a reinforcement to do so. (laughs) Yeah. And and I want to piggyback real quick because I was thinking about what you were saying. Because men who desire to marry, I always tell people, tell guys, underst- get the sexual discipline down while you're single. Mm-hmm. So you're not putting that pressure on your wife for her to perform for you every night. Mm. You know because there's going to be times when, contrary to popular belief, right? There's going to be times that she's tired. There's going to be times when there's the, that time of the month, right? All these different things. So what you're going to do? So you're going to go and cheat because... It was her time of the month and you you couldn't get any like is that really your reason for cheating or she just didn't want to have sex like is it okay for her to tell you no so yeah if you understand those things single if you get those things down going into marriage you'll have sexual discipline because people for some odd reason we think marriage gives us these superpowers we think we turn into Superman or something because we got a wedding ring. Look, the temptation is still there. The women is still there. There's going to be fine women. There's going to be, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I would love to hear your insight on that because I do think, you know, just playing devil's advocate, mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of women expect those urges to kind of go away because someone marries you. So that's when you get into the situation where 
you're out in public and you might see someone with a big booty walk by and you you do a little, a little, a little look because it look good. I mean, women, we look too. Let's be real. Someone got a nice booty. But it's just like, I think we also place unrealistic expectations on men. So what is the, I guess, what is the middle ground with that? I, I just think it boils down to having discipline, it, you know, because we talk about habits, right? We're talking about anything that you do over th three weeks, 21 days becomes a habit, right? So if we do have those habits of, of self-discipline, then we can be at a place where we're good and admire a woman's beauty. There's nothing wrong with admiring a, a woman's beauty. It's what you do after that that can actually cause issues. It's when you slide in the DM or you being uh, a little too friendly, you know, that can lead into a result. Because if you're used to being playboy, marriage is not going to change that. I don't know what people, I'm going to put my pay, my player card up. I'm going to get married. That look, that fire that's burning in you, marriage yeah. ain't going to fix it. Yeah. It's kind of like the women who are like, uh, and I hate that we have these discussions about, but it's the same concept with like just trusting someone to to lead in your home, right? If you don't put yourself in that mindset when you're single, like, okay, men can be trusted. Not all men can be trusted, but I know some can. So when I get into a relationship, I'm going to be able to transition without any struggles because I already have that in my head. We kind of think like, okay, I can be this way, this way, this way. Now I don't trust anybody. I'm in charge. And then it's going to switch like an instant light switch when we get into a relationship and it doesn't work that way. Oh, habits not hard. Exactly. I want to bring up something here that Travis said. So Travis says, what do you say to a father that guides his son and encourages him to not be serious with women and play the field until he reaches a certain level of financial success? Okay. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Travis. Thank you. Thank you for the, the question, first of all. When you say play the field, until, what is financial success? Because I hear a lot of guys say that. They like, once I hit this certain amount of money, then I get married. So here it is. You have a good woman and you're leading her on thinking that once he hit this certain level of finances, he's going to put a ring on my finger. There's no number that's going to make you happy. We have this irresistible insatiable feeling of always wanting more so i guess the question is when will we ever be content mm. and then playing the field i get it as a man but again if he desires to be with one woman playing the field because a lot of times people say sow your royal oats do all these different things mm. but it doesn't solve that inner issue that you have and like we talked about with mommy issues it doesn't solve anything when a man doesn't know who he is, he's going to leave a trail of hurt women and children behind him. Oof. Say that again. I do believe, <laughs> I believe change starts with the man because a lot of times men, we want to be leaders. We want to be all these other things. We want to be called kings, but when it's time to sacrifice for our tribe, we're not willing to sacrifice. Mm. 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 Yes, I agree. Yeah. And you know, I think the... The issue with that to a previous comment was saying how a lot of men were stared wrong. I think this is similar to how a lot of women are stared wrong. So if you just kind of think about it, right? So they say that men reach their peak financially when they're like maybe late 30s, closer to 40, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're saying that men should play the field until they get to that point, let's just assume that's the level of financial success that he was talking about. What are the women supposed to do at that point? Because if I'm waiting for you, right, I'm I'm preserving myself. I'm not doing anything until marriage the way you tell me I'm supposed to. You're meaning to tell me that by the time I'm late 30s, 40, that's when we're getting started with things. So it's like if you think about having kids, how does that add up? So we're getting mixed messaging. So the women are kind of told, you know, you were told wrong when women told you that in your 20s, you should live your life. You should have been focused on settling down. But if the men are telling younger men, no, don't settle down in that age frame, what are we to do? Or do we just always go for older men? I mean, I guess that can maybe be the, the solution as well, you know, but it just kind of really narrows down your options because we're telling people conflicting messages. Yes, because I'm, I'm 12 years older than my wife, right? Mm -hmm. But I do believe that there's some things that 
she's able to teach me, even though she's younger and we have young kids, right? Because she is younger. So that's even a conversation within itself too. When you talk about, should we marry older, should women marry older men? You know, uh, Chevis is his name, Chevis? Brother Chavis, hey! Chavis. <laughs> yeah. He's just playing the field. Yeah, it can leave you playing yourself, right? Because we have these misconstrued thoughts of relationships. And then once we get married, we're mad at our wife because she isn't doing everything that those past women were doing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we play the comparison. So yeah. I think it's important. And, and I always say this, you know, I always tell young men, Chase Purpose, not panties. Like she's going to be there. If, if you do what you need to do as a man, the woman is going to be there. The problem is most of our young men are taught to be lovers before providers. Mm, when you say lovers, sexual? Sexual. Lovers. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, I just had to clarify for the people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's where the issue. So here it is. Come out the gate, 18, 19. Here it is. You have a child already. Mm -hmm. And now you're putting yourself behind the eight ball and what you could achieve financially for yourself and even the hopes and dreams that you have. And this is why it's important that we we understand the gifts and talents that God is putting our kids, mm -hmm. because if we can lead them on that path, they're less likely to get. In. And statistically, it shows this, that young men who know what they're called to do, who parents who have them and even a community that helps them get to where they need to go. They're more likely to be out of, stay out of trouble than those who don't know their purpose and vision because they're going to be attracted to the people who have a purpose and a vision, whether if that's good or bad. I agree. I agree. So Bernard says playing the field can be a good thing. It helps you determine whether you want to settle down with one woman or not. <laughs> um this is kind of one of those things where it's like a, a pick your poison type of situation. And I think women face this as well. Have you ever seen the video where the woman, she's like running up the steps and it's like, guy A, he has these qualities. And she's yeah. like, no, no, I'm going to keep running, right? So I'm going to keep going till I get all the way to the top. And then you get there and you realize that your options, they've dwindled down or they're just not there at all. And so here's the thing. <laughs> I don't think that we should have to rely on other people for us to figure out what we want. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I think that we should normalize reflection, really getting to know yourself and doing that in the absence of another person, instead of feeling like you have to run through one, two, three, four plus people to be like, okay, this is what I want. Like, I think we should really focus on understanding who we are as people, understanding what our morals are, what our values are, instead of using other people in a sense as trial and error. And, and can I add to that? Real yeah, quick? yeah. Yeah. I wanted to say this because I understand where Bernard is coming from, but let's flip it because I think a lot of times it's always good to us until the shoe is put on the other foot. Mm -hmm. So say we are, say we, we buy into the whole thing of playing the field, right? It's when we get into a relationship with a woman and we realize that she's been hurt by guys who've been playing the field. Now we mad at that guy because he was playing the field with your woman. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? It, it's cool until it happens to us. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're a little more mindful, that's like, you know what? And, and this takes a disciplined person to say this, but I'm just saying. If we think about this person might not be with me for the rest of my life, let me handle this person with care. Opposed to sending other, you know, just trying, you trying to find yourself. So you just running through women, you know, and again, it's cool until it happens to us. So we can buy into the logic that it's okay to sleep around. And, and again, playing the field, I don't know. I think it's, it's playing the field. Is that saying sleeping with multiple women? Like, let's define this. Yes, yes. Let's expand on that. So B class. Okay. First of all, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate you. So B class said two things. I'm sorry, but playing the field as a man is extremely useful. There are so many things about women that you must learn through experiences. 
But he also said that playing the field doesn't have to include tons of sex and racking up partners. So B class, I would like to know what you think playing the field is, because if we're saying that playing the field is just, you know, taking multiple different women on dates, figuring out what you like and dislike, I'm going to challenge that because on every live stream that I've had, we talk about the concept of men dating and paying for dates and sex is usually an expectation. So is it realistic that a man is playing the field and dating all these different women and sex isn't happening with multiple people at once. I can have biased viewpoints on this, but I, I would really like to know what, what you all think. I think that's a great question. <laughs> I, th I think that's a great question, Tanisha. And I think too, and this is something I've learned over time because I remember going through my divorce and once people actually found out that I was going through a divorce, my inbox started jumping. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, like people were actually waiting, <laughs> you know, but in that process, I was like, it's not about playing the field. It's about getting myself together. And even if we went on a date or if I talked to a woman or whatever, you know, it didn't have to end in sex because you never know, like that person can become a great friend. One, mm -hmm. they can become a great business partner. Two, you just never know. And I think sex can really mess up a lot of relationships from because there's a lot of guys who blew opportunities with women that could have been a great business partner, but mm. they were too focused on trying to get in the bed with them. Yes. She looked at you from a different vantage point. That woman could have had the key to having a million dollar business for you. But because you didn't operate in integrity she looked at you different and now you lost that and you lost the bag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you never know who you're meeting. I agree. So you don't want to walk around burning bridges with people. But I think that's a normal thing. Now, if we think about, you know, just using culture, using people for sex or whatever you feel like you can gain from them, ghosting people, um, just having a lack of regard for others, kind of like you said, where it's like, okay, I'm not going to damage this person because, you know, they it might impact someone later on. A lot of people aren't thinking from that perspective. Now, B-Class, we're going we're gonna to go back to your comment because I want to understand, brother. Okay, so playing the field is dating around, having plenty of conversations, having some healthy situationships, keeping sex intentional. So are you saying that dating around for you is like maybe having platonic relationships with some women. So you're just picking their brain. You might not be taking them out on dates, but then there's some women that you're having sex with. I just, I, I want to understand that. And maybe it just, it could just be that I date differently, but I want to understand where you're coming from. I, I, I think too, Tanisha, and he, I'm pretty sure he's going to respond. Uh, men, when, when we do date, we put women in classes, mm. you know? So the first night we go out with you and if we kind of feel that vibe or she's probably a little more aggressive, you know, we put women in categories. So some women we will have a, a, a certain amount of respect for, some other women we might not. It's like, okay, well, she's putting it out there. Most guys are going to take sex if it's offered, mm -hmm. you know, especially with today's culture. Because I, I, I tell guys, I'm like, you don't have to brag about sex today. It's 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 easier today than ever. Which is really saddening, but yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. okay so what do you say? I had to play the field and fail a lot with women to learn what about the type of man I a need to be to have success with women, and b learning what type of man I want to be for a woman. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but Tanisha, and see, this goes back, and I hear exactly what he's saying. But this goes back to the mom and son dynamic. Yes. Right. Yes. This mm -hmm. goes right back to the dynamic because I, I heard a, a woman say to me one time, she felt like it wasn't fair as a mom with the standards that a son have on his mom. She felt like mm -hmm. it wasn't fair. But at the same time, you are mom and dad are the I don't care how many more years on this earth we have. Mom and dad are always going to be that blueprint. Yes. to the way we see men and women. I agree with that, which is interesting because he clarified that he had both parents and both sets of grandparents. That's so interesting to me because I feel like those are things that you learn from your 
home, ideally, ideally, everyone's situation is different. But for me, I guess just speaking from my personal experience, I learn what I like and I don't like. And some things I had to learn on my own. So I will say that. But you kind of get the, the gist of that from what you're learning at home. So do, and this goes back to what I said before, do we need to go through, cycle through multiple different people for us to learn that, right? If you just have those moments where you sit with yourself and you really think about what makes me happy as a person, I don't know if I always need to involve another person and use them. And I don't mean this offensively be class, but use them as a, a crutch for me to figure my own self out. Like, I think it's possible to do that without running through people. And then it also depends on like if you're doing that ethically. So if you are completely honest with these women and you're letting them know what it is and you have multiple different people, cool, that's fine. But a lot of men are not doing that. And that's just the reality. So they are probably playing the field, but they're not honest about it. And so they're building these different relationships with women. And the women are thinking like, okay, this is going in this direction. It's just you and I, because they don't want to be transparent about what's happening to push the women away and it's just a it's just a very deceptive strategy let me ask you this tanisha yeah um obviously i kind of have been out the game for a minute obviously <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about because a lot of times i hear women say especially with single women just from women like i coach they're like if he's honest about what he I, they're more attracted to the honesty than him trying to play a game Mm -hmm. So there are some women that's like, he can get it if he's just being honest. Mm -hmm. I think most women feel that way. But I oh, think that when we say that, men will bring up the examples of women who are like, if he tells them, I don't want to be with you, and they still try, right? There are going to be those women out there who are like, okay, you're honest with me, and you told me you don't want this, but I'm still going to keep trying. But there are a lot of other women who are like, if you're honest with me from the beginning about what it is that you want, I now know how to navigate the situation and not, you know, get my feelings involved or go in blind because I'm thinking it's something that it's not versus, you know, you just having me walk and you pull the wool from over my eyes and I'm completely confused. So I agree. I think honestly, that honesty definitely goes a long way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, so there was another comment. So Harrison, family values. Hello. Welcome. I don't know if I've seen you on my lives before. Uh, but if we were guided by men, we wouldn't need to be playing the field to learn how we ought to be with women. We need to be raised and taught by our dads and watch how they treat our mothers. Exactly. And I, I highlighted that because I know you spoke about that in your video where you said that you feel the key to improving our society, our community, it lies within the men. So can you talk about that a little bit more? Because Dr. Umar said something similar and he caught a lot of slack for that. So, so what are your thoughts? Yeah, the, the the issue with, again, the thing with men is like, we want to be Black Panther, but we don't want to do what's best for Wakanda, right? Mm. So that, that I think that's the issue. And a, again, a lot of times, and no shade to single moms, but I believe that men, we don't get that a lot of times when we aren't raised by dad. When dad is in the house, and, and mom will tell you, there's a lot of, when dad speaks, something just shifts. You can even think of statistically when mom goes to church, a lot of times the kids, they don't go. But when a dad goes to church, everybody goes. That's the impact of a father. And I think most of our men don't know their value because they might have not gotten that from home. So they don't believe that they have that much impact. I always tell guys, you work more than what you bring home every two weeks. Once we understand who we are, that makes the difference. But a lot of guys is walking around here totally clueless. They think their value is based on how many women they sleep with. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys don't know who they are. They just, they're out here clueless. Mm. And at the end of the day, they... They, they their worth is based on how many women I sleep with. Now, by the time you in your 40s and your 50s, now what? What what have you got to show for a bunch of women that you slept with? You slept with you slept with over a hundred women and none of them there to take care of you. Now you're in a nursing home. Mm, yeah, yeah. These comments, I'm just sitting here flipping through them. So uh Harrison Family Values again says, I learned not to do crack watching crack addicts. I didn't have to have a hands-on experience. When working a job, that concept works, but always, do you mean, but not always with women? Clarify that part. 
But I do, I, I do agree with the the beginning part. You can kind of observe what works for you, what doesn't work for you, without having the direct experience. So I do. I think that was what I was trying to convey. So I do agree with that. Um, and, go ahead. Sorry. And a lot of it comes down to our our uh, confidence, right? It depends if mom and dad spoke life to you as a kid, mm. and they let us know. You know what? I don't accept nothing less from you because you will do great things. How many of us heard that growing up? Mm. You know what I'm saying? So when, when we start to familiarize that in our home, our boys start to think different because I'm a firm believer and we date according to our confidence level. Oh, for sure. Yeah, right? For sure. So if we get in that positive affirmation from home, it's going to change the view that we see on women and even the way we, well, first of all, the way we view ourselves and then it's going to transfer over to the way we treat women because any man that respects himself, and, you know, that's, that's like, that's Bible too, right? Like the man who loves himself, you know, is able to, to love those who he's been entrusted with. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it comes down to confidence and a lot of men don't have confidence, unfortunately. And a lot of it comes from, especially in school right we we yeah. we like the high school girl we you know we you can't get the pretty girl but the high school quarterback got her so now you're mad mm-hmm. and now you're on this paper chase you're like i'm going to make as much money yeah. as possible. Uh-huh. i'm going to be a fortune 500 not because you want to help change the world but because you want to hurt women mm-hmm mm-hmm that actually uh, segues into my next point. But before we get there, it's a sidebar, but I saw this comment and I want to bring it up. So Shannon B says, these are weird talking points when most dudes have dads like Future and Nick Cannon. <laughs> Y'all talk like everybody has default Cliff Huxtable dad. I think that this comment embodies daddy issues. I think that the fact that we view it that way, that most men have a father like future or Nick Cannon, that's a part of the problem because we on this channel have also talked about how a lot of the statistics about the involvement of black fathers are very skewed. Black men are involved fathers. But so when we're speaking to men who are like that, the pushback is that most dads have a future or Nick Cannon as a dad. So how does that, I guess as a father, how does that make you feel knowing that that's the stigma? Me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Honestly, I'm I'm okay with it mm-hmm. because I live life offline, so it doesn't bother me as much. Because now, let me preface by saying this: I do believe our kids have a harder hill to climb because they have social media and there are so many influences. Because when we was growing up, and I guess I'm telling my age, we only saw what we saw on TV. Mm-hmm. Now kids have access to, you know, they have seen so much more than the average eight year old have seen way more images than a man who's lived this full life. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things we have to combat as 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 fathers and, and, and dads. But I think it's about being consistent. You know, I, I always try to make sure that I love my wife in front of my boys. Um, and not just for shows, it's just because I actually love their mom. You know, so when they do get out here in this world, they can always have that comparison. Like, you know what? I did have love and affection at home. My mom and dad, they did love me opposed to what I'm seeing on social media or future or whoever is the next rap icon. I don't know. Yeah. But at least give your kids something. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you see this comment. Bernard says Shaw old enough to remember Beeper. So I got coming for Shaw like that. Hey, I, hey, <laughs> hey, Bernard, you right. <laughs> you know, man, you right. I remember Beepers. And you had to go to that phone and put that quarter in them joints. I remember that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that but and, and I would say this too, Tanisha, because I, I get it. I'm a little older, but at the same time, I always tell people I lived enough life. Mm-hmm. I, I, I get it. Like I've I've seen stuff comes and ebbs and flows. Like things come and they go. Mm-hmm. People get caught up in trends and they don't get caught up in truth. Mm. Speak to them. That's a quote. You need to put that on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So kind of going back to what you said before, where you were like, 
you know, if the a man sees that a more attractive or affluent man gets the woman, he goes on this chase to achieve all these different things to get women. So the other thing that I, I felt was a sign of mommy issues, which is normalized by society, is this idea of never being satisfied or being unhappy in life, right? So you you always have this, this need to do something better. You can achieve whatever it is, but you never feel like it's good enough. And I think that gets mistaken for ambition. And I want to be clear that I'm saying uh, ambition is good, right? So we should always strive to be better. But it's a difference where you just feel like it's never good enough. And so you're on a, a constant chase to achieve things, to obtain things so that you can feel whole within yourself. So you touched on this in one of your videos and you said that men who feel like this, they're often the ones who are manipulating multiple different women to get what they want. Can you can you expand on that, please? <laughs> yeah, when, when you don't feel like because there's like this uh the indiana jones scene right where he's running from the rock and the rock is kind of rolling up behind him and he's running you know that whole thing sometimes men feel like they run out of time mm -hmm. you know so they're like and, and and there's guys in their 20s they're like 23 they're like oh my god my life is over and i'm like so they feel like because I'm not a millionaire yet, because I'm not a, a you know, I haven't got the, the the gold play button on YouTube. They feel like my life is over. So I'm going to use and abuse anybody that I can get a hold of, hold on because I need to get to this desired place. And they're willing to use whoever they come in contact with. Um, so that's 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 the scary part. So I think a lot of men, they feel like they have to achieve it now. And again, I think this is one of the advantages of, of being older. You get to a place where you realize that you have to learn how to be content where you are. Yeah. Because a lot of guys, they, they're not content. And they are willing to run over whoever they can to get that desired outcome. And then you realize in the end, you haven't even really got to that outcome because you don't know who you are. You're yeah. Just, yeah. You're just running through women. That's all you know. Unfortunately. Do you think that men, do you think men realize this? And it's just like, at, at this point, I don't care. Is it a subconscious thing? They, I think some just don't care mm -hmm. because they're dealing with so much pain. Mm. They don't know how to process it. They just like, I just need that next hit for whatever it is. So a lot of guys, they know. Um, some guys are oblivious. Some guys are lost. And I think the guys who you can tell who have Tanisha, who have a good work ethic, you can tell people who have a respect for people, um, you know, who care about those who have less than they do. They have been raised by fathers mm -hmm. because they understand, like, there's a certain amount of discipline that nobody's going to give me nothing. I have to work hard for it. Here's my space. And I have somebody that's going to bring me along to help me to become the man that I am today. Mm. And you know what's interesting? So, okay. So Leo said that's everyone now always comparing themselves to other people, which I get. Yes, it is. It's actually a natural human tendency to compare yourself to people, right? Yeah. It's called the social comparison theory. You look at other people to assess where you are in life. So yes, that is normal. But I think what we're getting at is it becomes a, a major issue when you become so fixated on feeling like you need to achieve a certain level that you begin using people to get to that point. I like to call those people energy vampires, okay? They see people have good energy or they can get something from them and they utilize them, they feed off of them and then they dispose of them. And what's interesting is that I feel like the men who are like this are actually the men that are attractive. They have a lot of the materialistic things because they've gained those things or they, they've used their attraction or become more attractive with their grooming or whatever the case may be because they're overcompensating for feelings of inadequacy that they have within themselves. And so that's a, a major problem. But 
it kind of goes back to one of one of the what one of the other comments said is like women are attracted to those men, right? So it's like it's a again a, a vicious cycle, and we're pushing for men to hit these certain qualities in life, right? You want to get the money, you want to have the cars, these are gonna attract women, but we're not breaking down what fuels a lot of those tendencies in men. So it's just mm -hmm. kind of reiterating what we're talking about. We normalize a lot of these toxic behaviors. And and we have to think about too with men, I mean our frontal lobe grows when it's fully developed by the time we were 26, 27. Mm -hmm. So here it is, our frontal lobe isn't fully developed. So we have bad behaviors and coping tendencies that we use before our frontal lobe is even fully developed. Mm -hmm. So by the time it is developed, we're still using the bad habits that we had. To navigate to, to numb the pain like kendrick said kendrick kendrick lamar said uh <laughs> you ain't felt pain until you felt the sober mm. you know? so. yeah right so mm -hmm. i think a lot of us are just doing things out of bad habit mm -hmm. to numb the pain mm. yeah yeah so be class i'm gonna see you talk about this for a while now we gonna talk about it thank you again for the super chat B class says does the advice of dad or unk work on modern women and he followed that up by saying y'all say we need to follow the examples of home but i know oh my god i'm so sorry hang on one second y'all my ring light is doing something weird today okay uh yeah we need to follow the examples of home but i know for a fact the way my dad got my mom would not work in 2023 men haven't changed much in the last 30 years <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, uh. B class. I, I hear what he's saying. Uh -huh. I hear what he's saying. But if you think about it, Tanisha, we have the internet. Mm -hmm. We have so many resources. That's never been a time in human history like today, right? So when we talk about modern women, and, and again, I'll use myself as an example. Here it is. My wife is 12 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a nurse, right? So she's educated, brilliant, smart you know, kick butt, take names later. Right. Mm -hmm. But women are still women. I don't care what anyone says. Like mm -hmm. if you're willing to be vulnerable, if you're willing to be consistent, if you're willing to be loving, if you're willing to be a protector, if you're willing to be a provider. And I'm not just saying finances, but to provide some peace. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? These things, these intangible things, we don't think about a lot of times. We just think it's just all boils down to money. Which means that's why a lot of times you end up with the wrong woman because you just thought it was all about money. Mm -hmm. But women, man, I don't care if there's another modern women, like modern women are still women. Women still innately like the basic things, and the basic things. But unfortunately, we feel like we got to take you to Aruba in order to make you feel. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful thing if you can do it. But yeah. like a lot of women, like, hey babe, can you fill up my gas? Like, can you fill up my gas tank without me asking you? Mm -hmm. Like that's sexy for some women. You yeah. just have to know what kind of woman you have, and most guys aren't willing to pay attention to the woman that they have. Yeah, you know. So I think to let's let's bring up B classes comment again because I want to make sure I break it down like each part because I, I, I hope I answer this question. question. Yeah. Okay. The way that your dad got your mom probably wouldn't work in 2023 because we know that just like how women are getting money, the access to things like those things have changed and those trends have definitely shifted the way women show up or display themselves in relationships. So I, I do agree with that. Totally do acknowledge it. But I think kind of what you were getting at, Sean, is that there's still going to be some fundamental parts of a relationship that regardless of what societal trends are in, right, there still should be those things there so that your relationship can flourish. So maybe with your dad, he was a full-time provider for your mom, just using this as an example, right? And so back then that really would have a real the woman in but maybe now people are 50 50 so that would have shifted right but they're still listening to one another compassion like you said respect providing a safe space like all of those things are still things that as humans fundamentally i think that we still want those things 
So I don't know if I would say that that has that much of an impact is what you're saying. The second thing that I'm going to say, I'm actually going to challenge that men haven't changed much in the last 30 years because this comes up a lot in multiple different ways. And it's so interesting to me because we talk a lot about, oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm like, do I want to go here? But we talk about feminism and we talk about all the different ways that the government infiltrated the family dynamics and it's impacted women in this way and da, da, da. I think it's very unrealistic to say that women are growing up in households that are feeling the aftershocks of these things and it's only changing them, but men are not adapting to that as well. Like, I, I don't think that we can say all men are a control variable over the past 30 years where we face all of these changes to family dynamics and it changed women, right? We have these modern women who don't do X, Y, and Z, but men just remain exactly the same. And we see that, right? We see it all the time when men are challenging, protecting women, doing for women, taking women on dates, like just doing things that men did 30 years ago. Those are things that are kind of like a, a challenge when women are expecting those now, nowadays. And I don't know why, why that's the narrative that we're pushing. Because we talk about the modern women. And I know one of the questions was like, well, you know, what is a modern woman? But I think we also have to talk about, well, what is a, a modern man? What does a modern man look like right the man who we're discussing right now who has the mommy issues who has the daddy issues who has this disdain to our women what does that man look like and how can we help this man better navigate dating that's a, a question that i've asked to all of y'all so i would love to know what you think <laughs> that is good and 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 i guess my question too would be if men haven't changed in 30 years then we're doing a bad job mm. like it, with all this media and access that we have, like Tanisha, we're in two different states. Mm -hmm. All this modern technology and if men haven't changed, we got a lot of work to do because women are evolving. If women are evolving, then men should be doing the same thing. But I do believe that. I think the thing, Tanisha, is we have to work together. Yeah. I always tell people. God made us interdependent, not independent. Mm -hmm. And if we're able to work together, we can kill this whole narrative of this whole man versus woman thing, you know, modern women and men. Like, I think we can make the changes if we're willing to work together. Because I will always tell people, and it's sad because, oh, shout out that we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Ella. Uh, it's actually how I connected with Tanisha. So, if we if we connect, if we get together and I would tell people I've been hurt by women before women I've dated, but that doesn't mean that I have an issue with women. That was just one, either my poor decision making or two, she was just dealing with the, the issue in her own life. I'm not going to bash all women. Like if you had if you had a bad steak at a steakhouse, you don't stop eating steak. Right. Right. So we need to talk, says the expectations of women have evolved while the expectations of men have remained the same. What do you feel about that? Uh, the expectations of women have evolved while the expectations of men have remained the same. I think a lot of that comes down to men not evolving like we like we have to start thinking different we have to get along we have to get along with the changes we have to be okay with making change like when change comes you have to go with the times if yeah. not you will be a dinosaur you know what i'm saying <laughs> you will be a fossil yeah. so i think a lot of us have to live some life right get around i and, and and i'm a big believer in this this is why you got to have the 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 healthy relationship with mom or your sister or stuff like that you can learn from them mm -hmm. they can always give you game not so much of how to run game on women but how to respect a woman i think we've gotten away from that and i'm big on accountability on personal accountability so mm -hmm. It's easy to be like, women are this, women are that, but it's your, like, you chose her. That was your choice. They, they are a result of your bad decision making. So before you blast women, you chose her because if you had any good sense, you 
would realize that, you know what? My attention alone might not be enough for her. Mm. Do you think that that inner dialogue happens a lot, though, for men? No, because men think with their other head. And this is this is the difference between having discipline and self-control opposed to just wanting to sleep around and not knowing when a man knows who he is, Tanisha, he just moved different. Mm -hmm. he, he the the type of woman he chooses, he moves different. So when I hear a lot of guys like women not doing this, women not doing that, all I'm thinking is you saw TNA. That's all you saw. <laughs> My brain had to process what TNA is. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all you saw. And then at the end of the, because here's the thing, Tanisha, with a, a great woman will 10x your life. Mm -hmm. She will blow your life up. And unfortunately, a lot of guys, they feel like, oh, well, I haven't seen the 10x woman. Yeah, because again, you choosing bad, bro. You got to move different. And stop chasing women and start learning more about yourself. And that doesn't mean sleeping around with women. That means learning more about yourself. That means mm -hmm. reading. That means learning. My mentor used to always tell me, don't tell me who you're over until you tell me who you're under. Mm. So who's mentoring you? Because if you have a mentor, you're going to move different. But a lot of these guys out here, they just don't have those mentors because they have too much pride to submit themselves to another man. Ooh. Most men aren't willing to submit. Tanisha, I would not be where I am today without me submitting to another man's vision. Right. Mm. Let's talk about that. Like that. Hold on. Let's pause that. That's, that's like that could be a whole other trajectory, but that's that's good. So I think what what Alan is saying though is like I know where he's going with this. Just know it, him, and it's like I do I do agree to an extent. Um, just thinking, oh, this is tough because <laughs> I'm like, do I really want to go down here? But I do think that in terms of what the expectations of men are, right? So financial support, which is probably going to be the biggest one that we see nowadays. Those have been kind of constant expectations. But when it comes to like what women are expected to provide or do in a relationship, I I do think, Alan can tell me if this is what you're saying, but I think that we begin to come up with these mental gymnastics about why women don't have to do those things, right? So there is some truth to it. Um, but I will say like expectations are expectations. I think on both sides, both parties are not fulfilling those expectations. So I can say my expectation is for a man to pay hundred percent of the bills. But at this point, how many men are really doing that? Can you do that? You know what I'm saying? So it's like expectation versus reality. Those are two, two vastly different things nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I think too, sometimes we, uh, the, the, just the things that we see on social media and because a lot of times we're always using Jay-Z and Beyonce, like we're using these stars, right? We're using an exception opposed to the rule. So for us to still have the 50-50 conversation for like, how, how are we going to progress as a people and we still having conversations about, you know what I'm saying, 50-50, like we, 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 we have to do better. We talk about mental health and all these different things, mm -hmm. but I think we really might not see that fruit until our children are adults. I think we are possibly laying some groundwork for them to be better, which is ideal, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if we do teach healthy relationships in our homes first, then I think that teaches our kids how to move. And, mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> here's the funny thing. We are all, I tell, I tell people all the time, we are all broken as people. For sure. We're all broken. But the first time that we see somebody with a flaw, we drop them. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're human. I'm done with you. Yes, yes. Like, healthy marriages aren't found, they're built. People say they want the healthy relationship, but they're not willing to put the work in. They're not willing to lay brick by brick because... 
marriage is simply a mirror. Mm -hmm. It helps you to see all your flaws. And one issue that men have with mommy issues is uh, in that list, they talked about how a lot of men can't take criticism. Oh, talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't take criticism. Mm -hmm. So as a man, if I can take criticism, especially your attachment styles, especially if we can take criticism from our dad, if we can take criticism from other men who love us, who care for us. Mm -hmm. we can definitely take that from our woman if we embody that environment of correction with men first. But unfortunately, a lot of men don't have that. So you said that men struggle with submitting to the guidance of another man. Let, let's talk about that, right? So how, how do we combat that? And I'm going to kind of add on something to this. So one of the the things that kind of baffles me, let's let's use a single mother, for example, right? A lot of men don't want to date women who already have children, which is fair, right? Because I feel the same way. I don't have any kids. But my concern is like for every child that is there, and let's just use the example of a little black boy, he is now going without guidance because nobody wants to deal with him, right? So it's like if we're not, not saying that you have to show up in the, the form of a boyfriend to the mother, but like, what are we doing to mentor the youth? I feel like that can use a little bit of improvement from what I'm seeing. But what do you, what do you think in terms of the, the avenues that are already there? So we have mentorship programs, we have things like that already. What can we do so that one, men are more open to the help that is there, um, but also how can we better serve the men with the avenues that we already have? Yeah, it comes with community. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it comes down to am I willing to be am I willing to be uh vulnerable first with my flaws? That's how men open up to other men. Because a lot of times the first thing a man says to another man is, what do you do for a living? So that automatically <clears throat> puts us on a certain kind of pedestal to how they're going to respect us. If I say I work at Wendy's, you're going to be like, oh, he ain't no good. But here I am happily married at home. Mm. So I think with men, we always gauge what on what we can do. Uh, what do we do opposed to who we are? Mm -hmm. So that makes the difference right there because that's how we start the conversation. What do you do for a living? And then we gauge it from there. So to the people who have, and I'm throwing them air quotes, uh, influence or some form of power that you respect, I think those people who are in a little higher places, if they have some kind of integrity of themselves, uh, depending on how you view that person, I think if you're willing to take those people under your wing. I'm not saying that you have to spend your whole day with this person or stuff like that, but just to for them to see how you move. Because that's what men, that's what men are looking for. They want to see how you move. Mm -hmm. You know, if I get a new follower on, on, on social media, they just want to see how I move. Do he really love his wife? He said he loves his wife. Let me see. Now, yeah. yeah. So now when they see that, then they take one step closer. Okay, I think I can rock with him now. Mm -hmm. Because he's doing what he's saying. So I think that's how men, that's how we can coach, that's how we can foster that community. It's just through connecting with other men, being vulnerable, starting with me. And mm -hmm. then we develop each relationship at a time. And again, like I said, Tanisha, it's a slow burn For because sure. I, we like to think that we could just change the whole world and, you know, just kind of mm -hmm. any hand jacket and just throw it and everybody's knocked out and laid over uh, that whole thing. But we have to do one relationship at a time. That's how we impact others. And that's through our kids. That's through our next door neighbor even social media to a degree. I agree. And I think one of the, the comments earlier, is, it talked about how we become very individualistic as a society. And I just noticed that everything is a, a money grab. Like, how am I benefiting from this? And I think that more of us need to adapt the mindset of humble servants. And yes, of course, we are all in need of money and money pays the bills, right? 
but it needs to be a thing where it's like we're all contributing to the greater good of society versus only helping people when we can put a price tag on a service or only helping people when it's doing something to directly benefit me in this moment. And I feel like that's probably one of the biggest disconnects that I'm seeing. Yeah, especially for men. It's mm-hmm. it's unfortunately a lot of it is is the dollar amount. They want to they want to know if you married to a bad chick. That that that's influenced to a man, a man too. Oh, he married to a bad chick. Oh, okay, that's influenced by today's standards mm-hmm. and how much money you make, uh, the size of your following, and what your Instagram is looking like. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's 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 just the, the day and age that we live in, <laughs> unfortunately. There's a couple times I'm <laughs> just looking at these like, oh my god! All right. So the steak sandwich. Hey, what's up? So a lot of this conversation is predicated on that one should aim for a particular type of long-term monogamous relationship, or that is the natural result of growth. Is that the case for everyone? Very good question. Thank you. So this gives us a chance to clarify. Um, I don't think that your growth is dependent on you being in a relationship. But I think that your relationships with people, right? So that can be platonic, it can be romantic, whatever the case may be, the way that you treat them, that is a direct correlation with the work that you've done on yourself. So what we're saying is that there are a lot of, because we're talking about men today, men who are walking around with disdain toward women, and that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Now, those ways happen to align with relationships that are not platonic a lot of the time because we're talking about, you know, using women for sex or, you know, whatever the case may be. But it could just be how you perceive women in general. I've had conversations with some men where as soon as you start talking about dating or any other things that we talk about, they instantly get aggressive and it's an emotional response. And it's you women, y'all do this, this, this and that. We're not in a romantic relationship, but the way that they're engaging with me shows that there's something underlying that's there. So it's not, again, just based on romantic partnerships with people, but the way that we interact with one another, how we speak about one another. Do I respect you and see you as a person or do I see you as a monolith for every man or woman that's out there? So that that is what I'm referencing. Mm. Tanisha, can you can you answer one question over here? I see in the comments this is good right here. I want to talk about this. Okay, one. what's up? What's up? I think it's A B. Shout out to A B. He says, married men don't have a clue about modern women. Married folk have no idea how it is out here. They believe most women are somewhat similar to their woman. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I think that you're, it's more appropriate for you to maybe answer that. Like, how, yeah. do, you, <laughs> how do you feel about sure. that? <laughs> and that's why when I seen it, I was like, yeah. bring AB up to the stage. Yeah. Right. Respect what he's talking about. Total respect. Right. It's not so much about the woman that, y- it's not the about the woman that I have. Again, it's a reflection of who I am. I think we put too much weight on other people. Like, it's these women out here. No, it's you. And and this is the thing about men and accountability. Once we get, I'm, I'm coming out with a t-shirt that, that says cuss word, that uh, accountability is not a curse word, right? Yes. <laughs> because men became men because they were accountable. And this is no shade to, to any man. I'm just saying, like, because we were are were accountable, that helped mold us into the men that we became. But now it's like if you have an opinion, people are ready to throw you to the lions. It's like we can disagree and still be cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't have like even when I met my wife, I didn't we didn't have to get married. But at the same time, I knew what woman worked for me. Like, you have to know what works best for you, not what culture says a woman should be. You have to know what works best for you. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that's what we get caught up in because we're like, oh, culture says this, this, and this, but that's not who I am. Well, yeah, it's like, yeah, you know women, but do you know your woman? Mm. It's different. Mm. So, I get what he's saying about married men don't have a clue about modern women. I I, I get what he's saying. 
Mm-hmm. But I mean, here it is. I'm going on six years of marriage to the woman I'm married to now. I still had to decipher six, seven years ago what kind of woman I was going to choose. Real quick, Tanisha, before I met my wife, there was a lady I was talking to, and, and my wife knows the story. The difference between her and my wife was this is just for me, mm-hmm. was their relationship with God. Mm. Right? Here was my thing. I told I told the girl I was dating. I said, because I'm like, hey, let's have Bible study once a week over the phone. She lived in Atlanta. I was in Arizona. She's like, okay. A couple of days ago passed. She's like, hey. Uh, she told me, and I'm glad that she kept it real. She said, you know what, Sean? I'm really not into all that God stuff like that. And I respected her for that. But that told me right there, she is not the one that I'm looking for. Right. Right. Because for me, I need somebody who loves God more than they love me. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you have to just know what works for you. I don't know if that's the answer, uh, AB. I don't know if that was the answer you was looking for, but you know what's interesting to me about this because it's um, I think that we we fall victim to having conflicting viewpoints, and for a couple of reasons. So totally understand what you're saying, like people who have been married for a long time, they don't really know what dating is like nowadays. So they might not be able to speak on it. But then we listen to a lot of these people on podcasts, for example, who are giving you relationship advice and they are not in a healthy relationship. They're not even dating anybody. They're out there struggling like we are, right? But we take what they say as Bible and we begin to emulate what their beliefs are. And it's like, but you are trying to give me advice on something that you are not living as well. And also when it comes to, if you think about a woman, right? Men hate when women listen to their single friends. Like don't listen to your single friends. Like they're going to give you advice to skew you away from me. I could give you advice as a woman who's been in a relationship. Let's say I'm not married, but I've been with my boyfriend for, let's say five years, right? I'm not on the dating scene, but if I give your girl advice, you would probably like the advice that I give her because it's going to be helpful for your situation. So I think we need to kind of pick our poison because a lot of the the viewpoints in those situations is that you should be seeking advice from someone who's in the position that you want to be in. But now all of a sudden, when we have a married person who is giving us gems and, you know, letting them know what worked for them, and you can apply that as you see fit, right? Just take gems from that lesson. It seems like we're kind of picking it apart, picking it apart to fit the narratives that we have. And so I just want us to be a little bit more mindful of that because it's like, okay, do you want to listen to the person who succeeded in this or are you going to be listening to the person that's still struggling? What are you looking to get from the advice that you're receiving? So I don't know. When I saw that, it was just a, a little bit of a disconnect there. I love that. Can I, can I say one thing real quick? Yeah, yeah. And, and this isn't arrogant, right? But I, I'm just going to say this. This isn't arrogance. But if if I was single again in 2023, I could find me a wife. Mm. I could because I know who I am. Yes. And I know what I'm looking for. And I know what I value. There's a lot of great women out here. But a lot of times we just we want this person to be perfect. When we just as broken as we can be. So I could I could find somebody. I mean, here it is. I married my wife in six months. We met on Instagram. Mm. And she's the baddest chick in the game. Listen, you check your DMs, me. ladies. Respond to those DMs. All right. Your husband's there. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, yeah. I, I just I just want my dudes to be good. Like I just want I want my brothers to succeed because at the end of the day, if we are good, we have the power to to change culture. Mm. Kofi, I don't know if you left the chat already, but I'm going to acknowledge it. Thank you so much for the super chat. I know you're going to get some food, but thank you for stopping by. I appreciate you being here, and I, I do value these conversations. So thank you again. With that being said, be class. <laughs> right. <laughs> we we going at it tonight. Best advice is experience. Get outside. I feel so many different ways about this because I feel like there are things that I can give good perspectives on or things that might be healthier perspectives, but I haven't experienced it. I don't have kids, but I know when I do have a child with someone, what I want that person to look like and how I want our dynamic to be, but I haven't been there. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, 
yes, experience is a good teacher, but I think you can also witness things and figure out what works for you and how you're going to adapt your values based on that. Like you might see things that your parents did in their relationship and you didn't experience that. That was their relationship, but you learn from it and you can pass that on to other people. So I don't know. Again, my, my viewpoint stands the same. I think experience is great, but I also think that there are some times where you don't have to be in it in that moment to still give valuable feedback. I don't know. And also, like you were saying, I don't know if the dating climate has changed that drastically within the past five or six years, like you mentioned, where you would be completely out of touch with what's going on. I, I, I wouldn't be out of touch. I mean, the only the only reason why I was out of touch was because I was married for 15 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when I got married, I mean, Facebook was like new, new, new. You know what I'm saying? Um, So that was the difference between Facebook and then divorcing after 15 years. Yeah. He said, I'm grateful for my wife and I refuse to dip my toes into the acid water called the dating pool. Yes, stay where you at. Throw up out here, man. Stay where you at. Yeah. And, 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 and I've met in, in Tanisha I, and just from people that I've coached, clients, stuff like that, there's people out here that's willing to do the work. It just depends on what you're attracted to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? D-Class also says most men can find a wife, but she might be aesthetically popped, though. This is what you guys tell us when you tell us we can find a husband, but he might not look the way you want him to look. So I think we have to really assess what it is that we're looking for and really lay that out against a lot of the superficial qualities that we look for. I think this is the issue with a lot of people, honestly. Like, your partner is probably somewhere... And you're overlooking them because they possess some quality that doesn't even really matter in terms of the longevity of a relationship and you're making it a big deal. So I honestly think this is what a lot of people are struggling with. I, I think a lot of <clears throat> I think a lot of people too don't get me wrong, attraction is so important because if you plan on marrying this person, I mean the, the least that <laughs> the least you want to do is be so attracted to them to where if they got mad at you, you like, you know what, but you're still fine. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> so that's important. That's important. Yes. <laughs> that's very important. But to me, this is just my opinion. What are your top three things? And, and let's keep it a book because there's men in the, in the, in the chat, right? Let's keep it a hundred, but I just want to be respectful. You know, if you a boob man, there's a lot of women out here that got boobs that you can have an option to choose from. There's a lot of them out here. I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? You can go to the grocery store. You know, if you like a woman that got a big butt, there's a whole bunch of them out here that got big. Like, yes, those things matter. But at the same time, we don't, Tanisha, we have a tendency to overlook the moral part. We look, we, we, we like more of the physical traits opposed to the uh uh the important traits the the inner man the stuff that's in our heart right you have substance yeah for sure yeah like are they respectful are they honorable do they you know have a respect for for people you gotta have big <laughs> hey i feel you leo I was, <laughs> I, hey i'm totally for it i mean I, I seen my wife on instagram i was scrolling i was like let me see what she got <laughs> you know what i'm saying I was like, Lord, please let her have a butt. Please. <laughs> it ain't even got to be a big old, you know what I'm saying? Is, does it, is it proportionate to her body? Right. And I was scrolling. I said, okay, thank you, God. I'm, I'm going to slide in her DM now because she got a booty. So hopefully that booty can match what she got on the inner, inner man, you know? And that was one thing that I loved about her was that she have a heart for homeless people. She had she has a heart for people who can't do anything for her in return. Mm. So yeah. I was like... If she have a heart for people that can't do anything for her in return, how much more, and I'm willing to give, she gonna do for me. Mm -hmm. But we have a tendency to overlook those those character traits. Yeah, I agree. And um, so other people are saying, you know, we're not gonna bypass the physical trait. I I said this before. I do think that attraction is important for sure. But I think that when we think of attraction, we're looking for people who are on the higher end of the scale of attraction, because that's what we're seeing a lot on social media. But what we're seeing is the result of makeup or filters or, you know, all these image editing apps. So it's not realistic. And so it's skewing our 
our perception of what attraction, beauty, you know, what that means. And so I think we should just be mindful of that. You can be attracted to them. Do they need to be like the finest person in the world? Maybe not, but that could still be your person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Brother Harrison family, Harrison family, he says, Brother Sean, does your wife make you a sandwich? <laughs> and, you know, here's a beautiful thing. She work a full-time job like I do, and she still takes time to make my plate for me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but again, a lot of that came down to me as a person and what I was looking for in a potential spouse. Not so much of her just being fine. There has to be more than her just being fine. Because you can be fine, but have an ugly attitude. Mm-hmm. And it just automatically makes you ugly, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to find out eventually. You might not know in that instant moment, but when you start really getting into situations with that person, you going to know. you got to know. <laughs> right? Today is not everything is cracked up to be. There was a... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm about to say, and then we're ready to drop them, you know, because it's like, yeah, she could, because... And this is old school stuff. You know, they say one man's trash is another man's treasure, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, she was she's fine to you, but to some other guy, he's like, please, will you get that chick to leave me alone? I can't stand her. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? B class, we're gonna come Ooh. back to you. He's still gonna come back. <laughs> you gonna Hemingway. answer that? Hemingway's which one? The one that's the one, one Hemingway just said. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, please. So, can you speak on how female curiosity plays a role on what men think they should have? Go ahead, you can take the flow. <laughs> oh, you want me to answer? Yeah, it? Go for it. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you. I thought you was gonna answer. I want to hear you. Want to answer? Go ahead. You good? <laughs> female curiosity plays a role on. I think it's the same thing. I think a lot of times women are in correct and let me know if I'm answering the, the question correctly. I think a lot of times women are looking for provision, protection, uh, love, you know, commitment. I think it's those, I think it's those basic things. I think sometimes and uh, Tanisha, correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but do you feel that women should discuss those things when they're dating or should they, because to me, I feel like sometimes women talk too much in saying like what they want in a man. Mm. So mm-hmm. he tried to become these things, yes. you know what I'm saying? He, She's like, I want to protect her. I want to, and then, and then, you know, woman, I want a man that loves God. He's like, yeah, so we're going to go to church. This and he ain't been to church in 30 years, mm-hmm. but now he want to go to church to try to get you. I agree with that. People definitely will try to adjust themselves. The people who are not confident within themselves will do that, which kind of circles back to what you said about knowing yourself. But then I also think that a a big part of it is just knowing discernment, having discernment when people do that. Because I think you can tell when someone's being genuine or not. So really being tapped into that. But I agree. I do think that women talk too much. And it was interesting because I was having a conversation with someone and I actually asked him, I'm like, well, it was something like, well, what, what do you feel are like green flags or whatever the case may be? And his response, I was like, I respect that. He was like, I'll let you know as I see them. Right. And I think if women could adapt that mentality where it's like, I'm just going to observe you. And when I see something that's good, I'm going to be like, hmm, okay, I'll make a mental note of it instead of vocalizing everything and kind of giving too much information too quick. You wouldn't run into those issues as much of men trying to alter themselves to be what they think you want there's a you got a you got a um you got some some love by lee yeah yeah shout out to lee for the money shout thank out. you so much lee shout out to you appreciate you so about the man submitting to the men's guidance aren't the kevin samuels followers submitting to his guidance how mm. about the podcast bro red pill content lol i think yeah. this kind of goes back to what i said about people who are let me let me think about what I want to answer before I say this. You have to decide when you're listening to someone, understand the messenger to figure out how you need to perceive the message. So I think this kind of circles back to a lot of what we were talking about before. Are you listening to people who are in the position that you want to be in? Or are you just listening to people who reinforce what your beliefs already are? Mm. And they're saying things that sound good and they're pulling on your heartstrings instead of challenging the way that you think. Okay, 
So just saying in this list of things that you gave, there's some people who might have been given some advice that didn't match their circumstance. Do you want to follow that or do you want to go with people who are walking in what their truth is? So I think that's what you have to decide when you're submitting to guidance. Mm, that was good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it and, and, you know, rest in peace, Kevin Samuels. I get it. Like he he just basically shook the game up. And to me, there really wasn't too much that he said that was really different than what most men talk about in circles. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just that he just put it on a platform. Mm -hmm. I just think he was willing to say things that a lot of men weren't willing to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know on a platform so and again it just boils down to what man like you said is this something that you agree with that made you want to follow him exactly exactly shout out to figuring ish out thank you so much for the super chat you always come through and show love so thank you so much we are going to keep live streaming y'all i love this i love tapping in with y'all so we will definitely keep up with it <laughs> yeah. thank you so much this is really, really good. Shout out to all the people that's in your live stream, like especially all the men, because I love to be able to connect with other men. Because a lot of the conversations we have uh, are they, they unfiltered. And a lot of people. A lot of people can't rock with that. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Um, but yeah, just have those those conversations because there's a guy, uh, Puka Fella Records. He says, nah, Tommy Sotomayor uh, said it a decade ago and they was going in on him, which is true. Because a lot of things that we deal with, Tanisha, that, like there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, It's just that times change and you get a group of younger people that's being born so to them this is new news mm. and right. you're like well, I, I, I don't heard that before it just looks different just because we live in a different day and age so what these guys are saying is really nothing new i just think it depends on my advice to a lot of men especially people on social media is just be careful who you take advice from because they could be speaking from a bitter place mm. Yes, yes. You know, because at the end of the day, if you don't know what they're dealing with. Right. You just seen that they had 600,000 views in the first hour and you was like, oh, that must be gospel. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But to me, if it isn't helping your, if it isn't helping you, if it's not you, then it's okay. You don't have to rock with that. You have to know what works best for you. And on top of that, are you willing to make some necessary changes? Because any healthy relationship will challenge you. And a lot of people don't like being challenged, especially when it comes to their beliefs. Yeah. And I think kind of piggybacking off of that, we have to be mindful of perception bias. So seeking out information that already aligns with what you agree with, right? You should want to be challenged. You should want to maybe check out somebody who you might see a title and be like, I don't know if I agree with that, but I'm going to hear you to see if I can develop new perspective. So just be mindful of that as well, because if you put yourself into this black hole of just looking for specific information, we know how these algorithms work. You type in one thing in Google, next thing you know, you got a whole bunch of videos on your feed about that one thing. You're having a conversation on the phone with someone, then you're seeing things pop up, right? So if we're intentional about breaking out of what we're viewing, what we're consuming online, it's going to keep re reinforcing those biases that you already have. Mm. Ooh, you want to take B class? Yeah, yeah I, I was already on top of it. Yes. Well, Sean used the word vulnerability about three times tonight. I like both of your perspectives on a man crying in front of his woman. I am firmly against it and not due to trauma. It's logic based for me. You go first. I want to see you. you. Want to, you want to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah. B class. Um, let me be vulnerable real quick. Uh, I Quick backstory, right? Let me just tell you this real quick. I was 280 pounds. I'm down to 190, right? Lost a lot of weight. Good for you. And sometimes the way I view myself, I'm just like, I still sometimes see myself as being overweight at times. I'm like, uh. so my wife's like, man, you good. Like you look good in that shirt, blah, 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 blah. She, I was in the kitchen drinking some water. I was being vulnerable with her about how I felt. 
she came up to me and she was like, she touched my face and she said, you know what? You the MF and man. Mm. She kissed me. Aww. And she said, don't ever let nobody, you know, and she just, just starts speaking life to me. And she's holding my face. And she was like, I just think you're the baddest man in the game. Like, can't nobody touch you. Can't nobody. Like, she just starts speaking life to me. And then I was like, oh, shoot. I just perked up. And yeah. I was, because I was being vulnerable, my wife seen my vulnerability and was able to speak to that situation that I was dealing with. So to me, I think vulnerability opens up so many doors to people. Even like I told you with men speaking to other men about certain things. If I can tell you about my flaws, if I inbox you and be like, hey, B class, this is what I'm dealing with. And we just start vibing. And I was open to you about some issues. You can be like, oh, man, he a cool dude. But if I hit you up in my inbox and told you all my accolades, you'll be like, this nigga You know what I'm saying? So I think it's about vulnerability. And to each his own, if you like you said, if there's no trauma attached to it, that's cool. You just have to know what works best for you. But I realize the breakthroughs that I get through with other people and myself is me being vulnerable. And that has helped me tremendously. Mm, yes, yes. And I'm going to answer that. But I wanted to first acknowledge Ali Roberts. I don't know how to say your last name. I'm so sorry. But thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the love. Okay, so I okay, I agree with what you with what your wife did in that whole dynamic, in the sense that I think that men mistake vulnerability for crying in a situation, mm. right? That doesn't mean that you have to cry, but it's just like being open with your partner about what is going on. Do you know what I'm saying? Like Brene Brown, I believe her name is, the author, she talks about how her and her husband, they sit down at the table and like, what percentage do you have today? If you're at 40%, okay, I got to figure out how to come up with the 60%. If we can't do it, then we got to make something work, right? So it's being able to vocalize those things, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be an emotional outburst. And I think that we, we have such a black and white way of thinking where it has to be one thing or the other. It's I'm either crying to my woman or I'm completely closed off. And I think what women are saying is that we just want someone who's in the middle. Now, I will say that there are some women, because I see TikTok and Instagram real clips and things like that, women are, they can be very ignorant when it comes to a man being open about those things. But I think that speaks a lot to the men that she had in her life, right? Because I've seen my dad do both. I always say this, like, and I tell men this, like, this is why I like transparency. My dad will go out and try to be anybody's ass. Sorry to curse on the live stream, but he will, okay? He does not care. He will protect his family. But he's also had very transparent discussions with me so that I've seen the balance of both, right? I don't see it as it has to be one or the other. And so I think that kind of like what we were talking about before, when it comes to emotional availability, just unlearning a lot of the things that we've been taught and understanding that that's okay. But that goes back into knowing who you are and being comfortable within yourself so that that does show in your relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to piggyback off of that because one, one of the reasons for my demise in my first marriage was I didn't know how to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm because I didn't get that in my childhood. Because when I was vulnerable to my mom, my mom would be like, well, you complaining about this? Well, what about these bills? Mm -hmm. What about the, you know, what about me? What about stuff that I got to do? So that taught me, that programmed me that I wasn't important, that she didn't validate my feelings. So those very things damaged a lot of my relationships because I was like, oh, my opinion doesn't mean anything. So I would do a lot of stonewalling. I would do a lot of shutting down because in my head, I'm still hearing what my mom saying to me that I don't have an opinion, that I don't matter. So I chose yeah. woman, women based on my insecurities. So that made a difference for me. Can you expand I was on that? Because I feel like a lot of men might go through that. So when you say that you chose women based off of your insecurities, what qualities I don't know if I want to say quality. So what characteristics <laughs> would those women have? <laughs> um, they was just down for whatever. Like mm -hmm. the standards were wasn't as high. Um, we didn't discuss like boundaries and stuff like that. Like it was just more of like 
who's ever willing to to be like what's up you know somebody who was willing to pay me some attention like those were women that i chose because a lot of times men it's just like you know a, a shark a shark can smell blood like a lot of times men we can pick up on women insecurities mm-hmm. <clears throat> so um for me i chose women that i remember one time i seen this woman in the store I'll never forget she was dressed nice walked with her head up high or whatever and she just looked like she just walked in confidence and i said i, I was about to go up and talk to her. i said i'm gonna take my chance i'm gonna go and talk she was like boy you don't get out of here i was like okay oh wow okay <laughs> yeah but i was young i was like 22 i was like i was a kid you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. but that taught me a lesson like oh this woman all like she she ain't got time for me mm-hmm. you know so that let me know right there, like, oh, I, I'm I'm lacking something because she's seen it before. I can even really give her a whole conversation. Mm, mm, that's real. That's real. So, yeah, I guess B class to kind of summarize because he was saying how a lot of men are agreeing in the chat that you can't be vulnerable, reshaping what vulnerability is. Because for me, you could tell me something like. I don't know, just to give a random example, like my mom, when I was a kid, she did this, this and that. And it made me feel this kind of way. I didn't understand why she would do that. To me, that's vulnerability. Like you're disclosing something that happened to you as a child. That can be a very sensitive topic for us. So again, transparency, vulnerability, having intimacy with people. What does that look like? I don't think that it's always crying because I've been very vulnerable with people, but I've never cried in front of them, but I still disclose things about myself. So it's capable, it's possible for you to do that. And maybe you have those moments where you cry to yourself if you don't feel comfortable doing that, but just expressing what is going on, having that emotional intelligence where you're able to understand that something is going on and then conveying that to your partners, your friends, that can be vulnerability. So Tanisha, let me ask you a question. So how did, how were there, were there ever any men that you felt that you can be vulnerable with? Mm -hmm. And how did that go for you? Um, there definitely have been men where I felt like I could be vulnerable with, but I think that, hmm, how can I say this? (laughs) I think that when you're something, my therapist told me is that people don't need to know everything about your backstory. Mm. Right. So let's say I'm insecure about something. So something that I probably should tell you, let's say I'm insecure if I, if we're together and I feel like I don't hear from you all day, like that's something that's triggering for me. I probably should let you know that as my partner so that you're aware of it and you can decide if you want to adhere to that or not. I don't think I need to tell you I'm insecure if I don't hear from you all day because my boyfriend, he cheated on me and he took me through X, Y. So you have to know what your limits are because if you, if you release too much, you can run the risk of trauma bonding with people. And we don't want that, right? So you don't want to have that shared feeling of trauma with people. And so I'm trying to learn how to balance that, where I'm expressing things about myself to make it so that you better understand me for things that are going to be important in our relationship, but I'm not displaying or revealing things that you probably didn't need to know, kind of like word vomit. Mm. But I think men in general, I mean, I think... The only thing that I would have ever probably been concerned about is if I'm releasing or revealing something about myself and like, okay, is this person going to try to use this against me in the future? You have to be mindful of things like that. But I, I will say, I think that men in general are a bit more receptive to women being vulnerable versus the reverse. So that that is a thing for sure. So do you think that most women can't handle men's vulnerability? Uh-huh. Um, I think... A lot of women can't because we have all been conditioned to believe that men don't express vulnerability. And so when we see it, it's kind of like a foreign language for us. It's like, oh, I don't know what to do in this situation because I'm not used to seeing it. Right. Um, So I think that we just have to be a little bit we have to get more acquainted with how to receive that type of information so that we can properly respond. Because the same way you guys are getting the messages about emotions being weak, women are hearing that, too. Right. It's not one side. And this is what I was saying before. We're both growing up in these households. We're seeing similar messaging. It's impacting us in different ways. So women definitely do have these viewpoints for sure. I'm not taking away from that at all because I've seen it. I've heard horror stories. but I'm just saying that there can be 
balance. Like you don't have to be completely closed off. Like you can't tell me absolutely anything about what you're feeling. I think there can be a middle ground. Mm-hmm. <laughs> be class said, Tynesha, is that a red flag you have? I'm not going to go there with you. Don't, don't start with me now. <laughs> I'm being honest with you guys. Goodness gracious. <laughs> No, that's that's good. That's good because I've learned over time that every, like you say, everybody can't handle what you are willing to put out there. I think you know you maybe just kind of breadcrumbs, mm-hmm. give them a little something and see if they can handle it. If they can't handle it, now you know. You know but what I'm saying. Another thing, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, supporter of therapy. And so I think we need to understand that your partner is not your therapist, right? So there are some things that you might need to work through. And yes, your partner can be supportive, but a lot of those deeper rooted feelings that can be with a therapist. And so if your concern is that, you know, in relationships, you're not able to reveal those things. And I really wish that we would change our perception of therapy and be more open to it because that is an outlet for you. But a lot of people aren't willing to do it. And so you have to, again, figure out if you feel like you have things that you need to heal from, things that need to be heard. There are outlets for you to do that. But a lot of men tend to be resistant to therapy as well. I was going to say I was going to say about that, like, why does it seem like so many men are resistant? Is it just that they have issues with vulnerability in general? And why? Because therapy is so common now. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's common. Uh, would you would you date someone who isn't in therapy? Ooh, that's a good cool. Is it okay? So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a story time, and it's like it's so crazy how this comes full circle. I was dating someone, and it was very evident that he had mommy issues, right? And I noticed it, and so I would kind of give little subtle things like, okay, well, have you kind of put these things together, or have you figured out or thought about why you do this, or have you talked to your mom about this? If someone has issues that I'm seeing and I'm asking you, like, have you processed it? Are you working toward improving it? And you're like, no, 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 no. That's a problem for me. Now, if you are taking the steps to learn about yourself, you're on your own journey and you're healing from those things, I think it's possible to do that without therapy, right? Some people find that in religion, spirituality, you read, like you could do a lot of different things. Therapy might not work for everyone. You might not have the resources for it. So I get it but I need something. Like you got to show me something that you're developing a sense of self-awareness. If I'm pointing out things in you and you're just like, "Mm, no, I haven't thought about that. Or, oh, it's not a problem. And it's everybody else. It's not me. That's when I feel like I had to abort mission. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a a major red flag for me. Mm -hmm. I agree because I'm an avid reader. I love reading, um, love learning, but I will say that uh, vulnerability is what took my marriage to another level. Mm. It's yeah, it helped my marriage so much that like we like we could talk about anything now. There isn't anything that's like um maybe you know everything is just like you know this is the way I was feeling, and it helps us even when we have disagreements because we can be honest with each other because we know it's coming from a place of love. Mm-hmm. And it's not coming from a place to tear you down or to make you feel bad. But we have to get there. Like it takes work. Again, great marriages aren't found. They're they're built. So it's something that you have to be willing to work through. I think a lot of times people aren't willing to do the work to get the healthy relationship. They just want it Instagram ready. Mm-hmm. They want the wedding, but not the marriage, as I always say. <laughs> yes, yes. Hmm. AB, if I need therapy, I do not need a girlfriend. Again, too many people are seeking help disguised as romance and love. I do agree Mm. with the fact that if you're in a space where you're very unhealed and you're not doing the work on yourself, we do tend to be codependent. And that spills into our relationships with other people. But I wouldn't necessarily say that if you need therapy, you don't need a girlfriend because there's people who are married who can probably benefit from therapy and they're still making it work. You can always it's always going to be a journey to develop yourself, whether you're single or if you're in a relationship. And I talked about this in one of my other videos, but I I just don't want us to. um, And I'm guilty of this myself. Go into this hermit mode where it's like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm never going to be ready. I have to work on this. And before you know it, you're just always going to be by yourself because there's always going to be things that you have to work on. 
but I think it's possible to multitask. Ooh, can you take this question right here by start the convo pod? Yes, for sure. Depending mm. on insurance, therapy can add up to be a bill expense. Many want to, but don't want to admit they can't afford it. Can I? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I love this question. But to me, this is me. Mm -hmm. If you taking trips and all your Instagram pictures is you in other countries, how could you not afford therapy? I think it's about priorities. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? You can be in, in Brazil with you and your issues. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a temporary getaway. It's an expensive getaway. But you come back, you still got the same issues. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, and don't get me wrong, I'm sure there are some people who just can't afford therapy because there's a lot of people that live below the poverty line. And mm -hmm. I don't want to ever, you know, but for the most part, for the most of us, they can afford it. If you're getting the check every two weeks, you can afford therapy. I, th I just think it all depends on what you prioritize. Mm -hmm. You know that. And, and again, this is here. Here's another good hint to find out if somebody is really interested. Because to me, I believe self-improvement is top tier. I believe mm -hmm. if you're willing to spend the necessary money, right, wherever your, your treasure is, is where your heart is. Right. So I think if you're committed to learning, to reading, you're buying courses, you're buying books, you therapy, all those things. That shows me that you're a good candidate to possibly be with because you're willing to do the work. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, so many people taught themselves out of therapy and like there's therapists. I'm so happy to post resources, but there's therapists who do things on a sliding scale. A lot of jobs have employee programs where you can get sessions covered, even if it's like four sessions, for example, just to get what you need to out there, like to vent. There's community-based programs. We talked about books. There are people who are on YouTube talking about things that might align with what you're going through. And YouTube is free. If you got Wi-Fi, you got internet on your phone, there's so many different avenues. And so my concern is just that people talk to themselves out of things before they even try to put in the work for it. So there are a lot of different avenues there. It doesn't have to be you just paying for it. But that's why I was saying it needs to be some sort of self-development going on even if you can't afford therapy and <laughs> therapy is low key litty. yes it is that's real it is. That's real. i'm grateful for for my therapist man I, man listen the the my therapist especially my first one i got so many breakthroughs mm -hmm. tanisha stuff that i didn't even know i was just like because sometimes you just have to talk it through right and they just want to hear you say it mm -hmm. and you just be like you all got out of there like, I did not know I was struggling with that. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And a shift in your mindset can change every relationship. That's why when I hear guys or, or, you know, talk bad about women and stuff like that, I'm like, look, most of the time it's you. If you can shift the way you think, everything else shifts. It's just like, you remember, and to all the guys in the, in the chat, I don't know if you used to collect sports cars back in the day, but I used to collect the sports cards and they had the little 3D holograms mm -hmm. and you used to turn them and they would, you know, look a certain way. And that's the way I look at like relationships. Like if you change in your perspective, it looks different. But a lot of guys are still hung up on what happened to them in 10th grade, mm -hmm. what happened to them in the freshman year in college. And I'm like, so we're not going to get over that. Yeah. It's victim mentality, victim mentality. And I think it that cripples so many of us. And I always say it sucks. You know, some people have harder lives than other people. And you just have to decide, OK, are you going to sit there and soak in the fact that you had a crappy life and you have to work harder to reach a point of healing and happiness than other people? Or are you going to put in the work to do something about it? And that's our responsibility to do that. So we got to we got to let go of that way of thinking. Uh, <laughs> What's up? Uh, Tanisha AB says that supports my point if you require therapy 
and the cost of that, et cetera, then my relationship would take a hit trips and outing short-term goal, short-term joint goals that cost. Real quick. <laughs> Go ahead. Anisha, I have an individual therapist and I have a marriage therapist. Then mm-hmm. my, my wife and I both. So I, people look at me crazy. They're like, you got two therapists? Yes. My wife got her own therapist. I got my own therapist. We have a marriage therapist we see together because we invested in making our relationship work. Uh, so the trips and the outings don't mean anything if we don't like each other. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you ever went on a trip with a girlfriend or something like that and y'all were arguing the whole trip. It, it sucks. Yeah. But if you wouldn't address those things in therapy, uh, you just have to have much more fun on, on your trip because you can even talk about some things. You're like, you know, it was in therapy today. I didn't know you felt like that. You know what I'm saying? And it could just lead to a whole breakthrough. You never know. So I just think it depends on what you value. I mean, I'm just going to say if a woman, if you tell a woman that you can't, you can't put in the resources to a trip or things like that because you're working on yourself. That woman doesn't really like you. And so I think you just need to redirect your attention elsewhere. I mean, if they're thinking about a long term relationship with you, they should be wanting to see that you're putting in the work to better yourself. And if all women, which I highly doubt this will happen, but if every single woman you come across is thinking the same thing, then be single. I think we have a fear of being alone. And that's a a major problem. Like We always feel like we have to be in connection to someone else in some kind of way whether it's sex, a romantic relationship, whatever the case may be, it's okay to take that time to yourself. That's what you should be doing while you're single so that you're improving yourself when you do decide to be with someone else. And that's okay. Maximize being single. I love it. Maximize being single. So I do, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit because we always want people to walk away feeling like they got some gems from the conversation, which I feel like we dropped so many gems already. So many. For the men who are listening to this and they're like, dang, you know, I think that maybe I have mommy or daddy issues. Like I could definitely see how in my past relationships, my current relationships, I might have been doing these things that you guys talked about. What do they do from that point? What is the next step to become a a better person? I guess the question would be, that's good. I, I would like to ask, who are you accountable to? Mm. I think that's that's the, the big one. Because uh, if you aren't accountable to anyone, you will always be right in your own eyes. And you can damage a lot of relationships by being right in your own eyes. So I think that's the biggest thing. Who are you accountable to? <laughs> who are you willing to submit yourself to? And are you willing to learn or are you just set in your ways? I I would ask those three questions. Unlearn some things, Mm -hmm. you know, because just because where we were taught doesn't mean that that's always true today. Somebody could have just colonized you into making you think a certain way. So those will be my things. Those will be the three questions that I would ask for you to ask yourself. Mm. That's good. That's good. Um, who, what would I say? I think that in terms of accountability, I think that can be having conversations with people who you feel like you actually have inflicted trauma on. Like that can be a form of healing as well. I've definitely had conversations with people where it's like, yeah, you kind of met me at a time in my life where I wasn't the best version of myself, but I want to tell you about it. Right. Because Sometimes I think that we inflict trauma on other people because they don't understand why we're acting the way that we did. And I think women in particular, we tend to internalize a lot of things. So if a man couldn't do right by us, he couldn't commit, whatever the case may be, it's like, well, what was wrong with me, right? And they're walking around with that burden thinking that something was wrong with them. So if you can start kind of having, you know how people go through like a AA, And like one of their steps is that they have to make peace with their list of people, like have those conversations with people, but then also just learn how to forgive yourself for things Mm -hmm. that you have done. Because it's hard when you start reflecting on things and you realize like, wow, I really was messed up at this time. Everybody was messed up at one point, understanding that this is a journey we're all learning and just forgiving yourself for those things and then moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's kind of like the first step, right? That accountability piece. 
Um, but I, I guess I'm curious to know. So in the, the case of the man who has mommy issues, how do you recommend men navigate these conversations with their mom, right? So I realized my mom did X, Y, and Z. It caused me to become this way as an adult. How do you have that conversation with your mom? Mm, oh, that's good. I think it depends on how emotional, how how emotionally mature your mom is. Like, how is the relationship with your mom? Because if it's volatile, you can't go to her like, hey, mom, you traumatized me. She's like, boy, if you don't, you know what I'm saying? So I think if she's in a good space, depending on age too, because sometimes our parents can be a little old school in their approach, mm -hmm. um, just be vulnerable, <laughs> right? Come to her with what you felt like not pointing, because if you're pointing to her, then she's going to shut down. Just kind of reframe it to where you feel like you struggle as a child. Whatever you struggle with and kind of bring that to the table. And if they're willing to be open uh, and then you have to ask yourself, what are you looking for in return by having this conversation with your mom? Exactly. Yeah. Because if you're looking for her to apologize to you, you just might never get it. Yeah. So you know safe. I do remember that from last time. It's pronounced safe. Got to go to therapy together. I mean, yeah, I think that would be the ideal situation. I don't think that a lot of people have that luxury for multiple different reasons. So one of the things that my therapist taught me is that sometimes when you're having conversations with people, kind of like what you were speaking to, Sean, it's not about what that person is going to say. It's just about you vocalizing your truth. Because a lot of the, the weight that we carry is just due to the fact that we didn't express how we felt. And so there have been times where I'm like, look, I'm upset with someone. I'm telling you how I feel for my piece. I'm going to say my part and that's it. I released it and I'm going to try to move forward and process it. So I think just that in itself, that does a world of, it gives you a sense of relief, I guess you can say, just by not holding in that burden, carrying those emotions with you. Um, but I think also for the people who, let's say you have this conversation with your mom and she's not receptive. My girl, Tara, she teaches me a lot of lessons about people giving people grace. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that she said is that we have to start learning to see people as their inner child. So she views everyone as a child. Like, I'm not going to, because you have this role in my life, you're my mom, you're my sister, you're my brother, whatever the case may be. I'm not going to say you have to behave this way because you have that role, but I'm just going to accept you for who you are. Right. So I know that you've been through things that have shaped you to be the way that you are. And it might not be what I like or what I need you to be at this point in my life, but I'm just going to accept it. And I think that when you go on a journey of healing yourself, and I've said this before, but you learn to give other people grace. You don't agree, okay? You definitely don't agree, but you learn to give people grace. And it's like, okay, I get it. I don't resonate with it, but I get why you are the way that you are. And that provides a sense of relief as well. Mm -hmm. I haven't, and, and that's good. And I think too, you gotta have some form of empathy. Yes. I always think that's a character trait. I think that's that should be in your top five arsenal. If you're looking for somebody, I I believe you should empathy should be in that top five. Mm -hmm. Because if you can take a moment to think outside of yourself, that because we have this tunnel vision, we only see life through our lens. And if we can look outside of that and respect other people's opinion and where they are, like that's okay. And I always tell people we could disagree and still be cool. Right. I don't mean I'm gonna cut you off. So I think we have to learn about empathy and to be able to give that to people. And uh and actually people are open up more to you once you can respect their opinion and you don't judge them and you ready to drop the <laughs> drop the hammer on them. You know, they're like, oh, okay, you didn't trip out as much. Okay. Right. It's more of a safe space. Mm -hmm. and that's important for me. People always like the a common question is like, well, what are you looking for someone to bring to the table or what do you want in a relationship? A safe space. If both people feel safe to be who they are in every aspect, the relationship, I feel like it just flows so much better. But when we're on guard and you feel like you can't be, <laughs> when you're on guard and we feel like we can't be who we truly are and express what we feel and things like that, it becomes a problem. Tynesha, you cheated on me. Tynesha is in a relationship with herself at this time. So if you call that cheating, then hey, we are happy over here. So maybe... <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> you know, one thing that work that works works for me, and I had to learn this over time, is when someone is being vulnerable with you and they're sharing personal things. I've learned like keywords is like I'm listening, or tell me more. Like mm-hmm. I'm listening. Like don't even come to them sideways. Just be like I'm listening, or tell me more. Yeah, and you'll be surprised everything that start to unravel when they start to tell you those things. They just start talking, and then next thing you know, they just got a whole revelation because you gave them that safe space, you gave them that floor to speak. Absolutely. So, speaking of a safe space, if you know that you have these issues stemming from mommy, daddy, whatever the case may be, how do you recommend that people communicate this to their partner? And I think that this might be, I mean, it's relevant in all stages of a relationship, but when you're in the beginning phase of getting to know someone, because I think the the fear that some people have is like one vulnerability, you don't want to be seen as weak, but also you just don't want to feel like you're a burden to people by expressing these things that you're dealing with. And so we kind of internalize it. How should we be vocalizing these things to our partners? Ooh. I'm all about the slow, slow burn, right? So here, 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 here's my strategy. This is this is what I, I and it's worked in my own life. Read books together, mm. but you just can't come out the gate and just like pick a book on mommy issues. You almost kind of gotta warm them up, mm-hmm. you know. And then, and then, even by doing so, it deepens the intimacy in your relationship. You're like, hey, babe. You read a chapter, I'm going to read a chapter. We're going to read the same chapter. We're going to have pillow talk at the end of the night, whatever. On Thursday nights, we're going to do this. Boom. And y'all just start reading books together. Well, what did you learn from this chapter? What did you get from this chapter? Okay. And this is stuff that I'm doing in my own personal life. And then you can get that one book where you start to talk about childhood trauma or stuff like that. And now you start having them conversations. Right. And now that person don't feel attacked because you're reading the book together. You're not coming to them sideways. Now they're starting to tell you things like, oh, now you're like, I never thought, you know what I'm saying? So now y'all can have the conversation. Mm-hmm. But that's something that works for me. Um, and I think even maybe from a practical sense of, well, not practical, but I think you can just talk about your childhood issues. Yeah. So it's like an equal exchange of things. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be like, you know, when I was 10, da, 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 da. and it just got to be a safe space. It just depends on what y'all got going on. If y'all go out to dinner or whatever, you know, and just like I was thinking the other day, I was listening to this podcast, just whatever. Right. And then you talk about you and what you might have been through and how that affected your life. And if that person has that emotional intelligence, they're going to talk about something that they've been through. And now you've had a conversation. Mm. So if a person doesn't do that, do you feel like that's a red flag? Yes, because okay. to me, again, accountability is everything. And if you're not willing to have those conversations because you can be dealing with something that's damaging a relationship mm-hmm. from a childhood wound. And whatever you don't confront, you can't conquer. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's a red flag. People that don't take accountability for their actions, I wouldn't rock with them. I don't care how big your buddy is. I don't care how small your waist is. <laughs> Right. It's going to lead to big problems in the future for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we have been out for over two hours. Oh my God. See, I knew this conversation was going to go longer. I knew it. I knew it. The last thing that I wanted to close with, because like I said in the beginning, there were some men who are like, you know, what we're talking about men today. Can we talk about women who do the same? Or can we acknowledge the fact that, you know, if women are entertaining those types of men that they might have someone, something going on as well. So I wanted to quickly acknowledge that because I think that is very valid. So for the women in the chat, we still have some women in here. (laughs) Um, I think that when you are encountering men like this, understand that like attracts like, right? Because we talk a lot about, you know, there's no good men out here. They just do women dirty. They do X, Y, and Z. And I'll kind of go further to say that it's not what you attract, but it's what you entertain. Because there have been some men who come up in my DMs and I look and I was like, absolutely not. I already know you are not it for me. So I attracted them. 
but I didn't entertain them, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you are coming across these men who have the things going on that we talked about, so they're juggling women, emotionally unavailable, they disrespect women, whatever the case may be, understand that they are probably mirroring something within you. And that's a sign that you might need to work on things yourself. But that's where your discernment comes in, following your intuition, right? Learning how to listen and trust yourself when things seem off with the person. Because I feel like with any any of these red flags that we're talking about, a lot of women know you sent something and you just kind of push it to the back of your mind because you like them or you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. So learning how not to do that. And if a person did get past your defense, which is your discernment, figuring out why that happened. So that mm. is the, the message that I would have to women who are on the receiving end of everything that we're talking about tonight. Ooh, I, I agree 100%. Don't, right. don't ignore the, the discernment, especially that, that first gut feeling, mm -hmm. you know. Because for some odd reason with the ladies, I know sometimes y'all just be thinking like, if I, I just saw some grace, I, you know, maybe he deserved, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I'll give him a chance four kids later and, you know, no, you know, <laughs> you like, I knew I should have listened to my first good. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So knowing when to walk away is important for sure. Okay, y'all. So thank you so much for everyone who is still in here with us two and a half hours later. This was a dope discussion. Before you exit, make sure you hit the like button. If you felt like this was helpful, share this with your mama, your cousin, your auntie. Tell people to come through to the next live stream. I love having these discussions with y'all. Sean, are there any closing comments that you would like to say tonight? Um, shout out to everyone who was in the group chat today and everybody who asked questions. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be on your platform to be able to speak to your people, Tanisha. So I appreciate sure. you. Um, yeah, for the men, you have value regardless with a woman or not. You are you are complete as a man. You're good. And I think a lot of times when we start to see our value in ourselves, then we can add value to others. I think men has gotten a bad rap for so long that we just don't really value ourselves the way we should. And we keep playing the same narrative over and over again. Um, so let's let's just make some changes and know that you are valuable all by yourself. Yes. And understanding that even though there might be societal standards that enable behavior, just know, have that moment of reflection to know when you're operating out of hurt, out of ego versus you actually doing something because you feel like it's the right thing to do. So I think that is the, the biggest thing that I can kind of share with you guys, even though society might say it's OK for you to do. Understand that you have your own values, your own morals. You need to know who you are and then walk in that. Yeah. Shout out to AB. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yes, yes. Thank you, Amy. You've been great. And thank you so much for everyone who trying to, especially B class. You were giving us all those comments today. Like, thank you so much yeah. <laughs> for your perspective. All right, so we will definitely put Sean's information. If you want to follow him, we'll make sure we link his YouTube, Instagram so that you can stay connected. Thank you again for your beautiful energy. And until next time, stay safe, stay blessed. Have a great night. Bye. <laughs>